While My Pretty One Sleeps by Mary Higgins Clark. He drove cautiously up the thruway towards Morrison State Park. The 35-mile trip from Manhattan to Rockland County had been a nightmare. Even though it was six o'clock, there was no sense of approaching dawn. The snow that had begun during the night had steadily increased until it was now beating relentlessly against the windshield. He was near the entrance to the park now, and with the storm there probably wouldn't be anyone hiking or jogging. A state trooper had passed him ten miles back, his lights flashing, probably on the way to an accident. Certainly the cops had no reason to even think about the contents of his trunk. No reason to suspect that under a pile of luggage, a plastic bag containing the body of a prominent 61-year-old writer, Ethel Lamston, was wedged in a space-defying squeeze against the spare tire. He turned off the thruway and drove the short distance to the parking lot. As he had hoped, it was nearly empty. Only a few cars were scattered around, and they were coated with snow. He glanced around carefully as he left the car. No one. The snow was piling in drifts. It would cover the tracks of his car when he left, cover any signs of where he was going to put her. With any luck, by the time she was discovered, there wouldn't be much left to find. First, he made his way to the spot alone, following a steep path. Past it, and on a sharp incline, was a pile of rocks layered by heavy, loose stones. A year ago, he'd happened to be climbing in that area and had taken a rest on a boulder-sized rock. His hand had slid across the rock, and he'd felt the opening behind it. Not a cave entrance, but a natural formation like the mouth of a cave. Even then the thought had crossed his mind that it would be a great place to hide something. It was exhausting to reach the rock with the snow turning icy, but slipping and sliding, he made the climb. The opening was still there, a little smaller than he remembered, but he would force the body into the space. The next step was the worst. Going back to the car, he would have to take infinite caution to avoid any chance of being observed. In life, Ethel had been deceptively slim. But as he picked up the plastic-shrouded body, he reflected that those expensive outfits had concealed a heavy-boned frame. He tried to heave the bag over his shoulder, but perverse in death as she had been in life, Ethel must have begun the process of rigor mortis. Her body refused to slide into manageable lines. In the end, he half-carried, half-dragged the bag as far as the incline. Then sheer adrenaline gave him the strength to haul her up the sloping, slippery rocks to the spot. Ignoring the cold, as pellets of snow turned his cheeks and chin into a chunk of ice, he savagely tugged at the bag and then grimaced as it gave way, and Ethel's body came into view. The white wool suit was stained with blood. The collar of her blouse was caught in the gaping hole in her throat. One eye was slightly open. The mouth that never knew repose in Ethel's life was pursed as if to start another one of her interminable sentences. That last one of hers had been her fatal mistake, he recalled with grim satisfaction. She'd been dead nearly fourteen hours. It seemed to him there was a faint, sweet odor coming from her body, even with gloves on, he hated touching her. With disgust, he shoved her corpse down and began wedging stones on top of it. The opening was deeper than he'd realized, and the stones dropped neatly in place, covering her. A casual climber wouldn't be likely to dislodge them. The job was finished. He was frantic to leave, to be far from this dangerous exposure of discovery. The blowing snow had already covered up his footsteps. Within minutes, all traces of him and the car would be obliterated. In the gathering dawn, he headed back to the city, the bloody, torn bag that had been Ethel's shroud jammed into one of the suitcases under the spare tire. Now there was more than enough room in the trunk for her luggage. The roadway was icy now, the commuter traffic beginning. He made his final stop. A deep lake not far from the thruway, now too polluted for fishing. It was a good place to dump Ethel's two suitcases, carry-on bag, and purse. All heavy pieces he knew they'd quickly sink and get caught in the mass of junk that rested on the bottom. 
By ten o'clock he was in his place, freshly showered and changed, gulping straight vodka and trying to shake the sudden chilling attack of nerves. His mind went over every instant of the time that had elapsed since yesterday when he'd stood in Ethel's apartment and listened to her sarcasm, her ridicule, and finally, her threats. He'd spotted the antique dagger atop a pile of mail on her desk and reached for it. Her face had filled with fear and she'd backed away. With the exhilaration of slashing her throat, of watching her stumble backwards and collapse, he was amazed at how calm he had been. Ethel had been planning to go away to write a book. If he could get her out of here, people would think she'd left on her own. Everyone knew how eccentric Ethel could be. She wouldn't be missed for weeks, even months. Now, gulping a mouthful of vodka, he thought about how he had selected clothes from her closet, changing her from the blood-soaked caftan, pulling her pantyhose on, slipping her arms into the blouse and jacket, buttoning the skirt, taking off her jewelry, forcing her feet into pumps. He winced as he remembered the way he'd held her up so that blood spurted over the blouse and suit. But it was necessary. When she was found, if she was found, they had to think she died in that outfit. He had cut the labels that would have meant immediate identification. He had found the large plastic bag in the closet and forced her into it. Then he had cleaned the blood stains that had spattered on the oriental rug and packed the suitcases with clothes and accessories, all the while working frantically to make certain that there was no trace of blood, no sign that he'd been there. Ethel had the ground-floor apartment of a four-story brownstone. Her private entrance was to the left of the stoop that led to the main lobby. In effect, her door was shielded from the view of anyone walking along the street. The only period of vulnerability would be the dozen steps from her door to the curb. It was six in the evening. The streets were busy with people coming home from work. He'd waited nearly two hours, then slipped out and went to the cheap car rental. It was dark and the street was deserted when he returned. It had been hell to go back into the apartment. He pulled his coat collar up and carried the plastic bag with Ethel's body out of the brownstone. When he had slammed the trunk down, every nerve shrieked at him to get to the park, dump the body to make it to safety. It's all right now, he told himself. He was safe. Just as he was draining the last warming sip of vodka, he realized the one ghastly mistake he had made and knew exactly who would detect it. Neve Carney. The radio went on at 6.30. Neve reached out, groping for the button to tune out the insistently cheery voice of the newscaster, then stopped as the import of what he was saying sifted into her consciousness. Eight inches of snow had fallen on the city during the night. Terrific, Neve thought as she leaned back and pulled the comforter around her face. She hated missing her usual morning jog. She winced, thinking of the alterations that had to be completed today. Two of the seamstresses might not get in, which meant she'd better get to the shop early and see how she could juggle the schedule of Betty, the only fitter who could walk to work. She tied the belt of the ancient terry cloth robe around her waist, experiencing the usual fleeting wish that she had inherited her mother's pencil-thin frame instead of the square-shouldered, rangy body of her Celtic forebears. She brushed back the curly, coal-black hair that was a trademark of her mother's family, the Rossetti family of Pontici, Italy. She also had the Rossetti eyes, sherry-colored pupils darker at the edges so that they blazed against the irises, wide and questioning under sooty lashes. The generous mouth and strong teeth were those of her father, Miles Carney. Neve wiggled her feet into the padded slippers Miles called her booties and yanked up the shade. The view from her room in Schwab House on Riverside Drive was directly over the Hudson, but now she could barely make out the buildings across the river in New Jersey. Technically, spring had arrived a week ago, but it appeared that no one had told Mother Nature. Miles was already in the kitchen and had the coffee pot on. Neve kissed him on the cheek, willing herself not to remark on how tired he looked. That meant he hadn't slept well again. How's the legend? she asked him. 
Since his retirement last year, the newspapers constantly referred to him as New York's legendary police commissioner. He hated it. He ignored the question, glanced at her, and assumed an expression of amazement. Don't tell me you're not all set to run around Central Park. What's a foot of snow to Dauntless Neve? For years they had jogged together. But now that he could no longer run, he worried about her lone early morning sprints. But then she suspected he was never not worrying about her. She reached into the refrigerator for the carafe of orange juice. Without asking, she poured out a tall glass for him, a short one for herself, and began to make toast. Miles used to enjoy a hearty breakfast, but his massive heart attack had restricted his diet as well as ending his career. They sat in companionable silence, by unspoken consent splitting the morning times. But when she glanced up, Neve realized that Miles was staring at the paper without seeing it. All right, Miles, let's have it. Is it that you feel rotten? For heaven's sake, I hope you know enough by now not to play the silent sufferer. No, I'm all right. Or at least if you mean, have I been having chest pains, the answer is no. Nicky Sepetti gets out of jail today. But I thought they refused him parole last year. He served every day of his sentence, Neve. He'll be back in New York tonight. Dad, keep that attitude up and you'll bring on another heart attack. And for God's sake, don't you dare start worrying about me because he's back on the street. Her father had been the U.S. attorney who put the head of the Sepetti Mafia family, Nicky Sepetti, behind bars. At the sentencing, Nicky had been asked if he had anything to say. He'd pointed at Miles. I hear they think you've done such a good job on me, they made you commissioner. With all your publicity, you better take good care of your wife and kid. They might need a little protection. Two weeks later, Miles was sworn in as police commissioner. A month later, the body of his young wife, Neve's mother, 34-year-old Renata Rossetti Carney, was found in Central Park. It had been a cold, windy November day. At three o'clock in the afternoon, walking through the park to pick up her ten-year-old daughter at school, she'd been murdered. There were no witnesses to tell who had lured or forced Renata off the path and into the area behind the museum. Miles had been in his office when the principal of Sacred Heart phoned at 4.30. Mrs. Carney had not come to pick up Neve. Was anything wrong? When he hung up, Miles had known with sickening certainty that something terrible had happened to Renata. Ten minutes later, the police were searching the park. His car was on the way uptown when the call came in that her body had been found. When he reached the park, Herb Schwartz, his deputy commissioner, was there. Please don't look at her now, Miles. He'd shaken Herb's arm off, knelt on the frozen ground, and pulled back the blanket they put over her. She might have been sleeping. Her face, still lovely in that final repose, none of the expression of terror that he'd seen stamped on so many victims' faces. At first he thought she was wearing a red scarf. Denial. He didn't want to see that someone had slashed the length of her jugular vein, then slit her throat. The collar of the white ski jacket had turned crimson from her blood. The hood had slipped back and her face was framed by those masses of jet black hair. Her red ski pants, the red of her blood, the white jacket and the hardened snow under her body. Even in death, she looked like a fashion photograph. That was 17 years ago the crime was still unsolved. As the taxi crawled and slid along the slippery streets, Neve found herself wishing the fruitless, if only, if only her mother's murderer had been found. All these years, Miles had agonized that he should have taken the threat seriously. He was always blaming himself for somehow failing Renata. He could not bear the knowledge that he had been unable to learn the identity of the thug who had carried out what he was convinced had been Sepetti's order. It was the one unfulfilled need in his life, to find that killer, to make him and Sepetti pay for Renata's death. Neve's body trembled as she recalled how Miles would often tell her of how he'd waited for Renata, for the love of his life. He and Renata had married three weeks after they met. 
Miles had been thirty-seven, were not at twenty-three. It had been love at first sight. Neve shivered. The if-onlys would not stop running through her mind. If only the killer had been found and convicted years ago, Miles might have been able to get on with his life. At sixty-eight, he was still an attractive man, and over the years there had been plenty of women who had a special smile for the lean, broad-shouldered commissioner, with his thick head of prematurely white hair, his intense blue eyes, and his unexpectedly warm smile. She was so deep in thought, she didn't notice when the cab stopped in front of the shop, Neve's place. The display windows that faced both Madison Avenue and 84th Street were wet with snowdrops, giving a shimmering look to the flawlessly cut silk spring dresses on the languidly posed mannequins. It had been her idea to order umbrellas that looked like parasols. Sheer raincoats that picked up one color in the print were draped over the mannequin's shoulders. Neve joked that it was her don't-be-plain-in-the-rain look, but it had proved wildly successful. She thought, I own this place. It was a realization that still thrilled her. Six years ago, the previous shop had gone bankrupt. Neve had just graduated from college. It was her father's old friend, the now-famous designer, Anthony Della Salva, who had bullied her into taking it over. So you're young, he'd said, dropping the heavy Italian accent that was now part of his persona. That's a plus. Better yet, you've got the know-how, the flair. I'll lend you the money to get started. If it doesn't work, I can use the write-off. Besides, I need another place to sell my clothes. That was the last thing Sal needed, and they both knew it, but she was grateful. Miles had been dead set against her borrowing from Sal, but she had jumped at the chance. Something she had inherited from Renata besides her hair and eyes was a highly developed fashion sense. Last year she had paid back Sal's loan, insisting on adding interest at money market rates. She was not surprised to find Betty already at work in the sewing room. Figured I'd better get a jump on things, Betty announced. I've got an awful lot of pickups today. Neve pulled off her gloves and unwound her scarf. Don't I know it? And Ethel Lamston insists she has to have all her new outfits by this afternoon. Oh, well, everybody should be such a good customer. A surprising number of shoppers braved the snow and slippery sidewalks to come into the store. Two of the saleswomen hadn't made it in, so Neve spent the day on the sales floor. She changed into a two-piece dress from one of her newest designers. It was a pale gray wool with a silver belt that rested on her hips. The tulip skirt barely skimmed her knees. A silk scarf in tones of gray, silver, and peach was knotted at her neck. Two customers had ordered the outfit when they saw her wearing it on the sales floor. With a practiced eye, she took in every detail of the shop. She knew that one of the key reasons for her success was the availability of jewelry, purses, shoes, hats, and scarves so that a woman purchasing a dress or suit didn't have to hunt elsewhere for accessories. Except for the exquisitely gowned display mannequins, there was no clothing in sight. A potential customer was escorted to a chair, and the sales clerk brought the dresses, gowns, and suits for her selection. It had been Sal who advised Neve to go that way. Otherwise, you'll have klutzes yanking clothes off the rack. Start exclusive, honey, and stay exclusive. As usual, he was right. As the afternoon wore on, fewer clients came in. At three o'clock, Betty emerged from the sewing room. Lamston stuff is ready. Ethel Lamston was a highly successful freelance writer with one bestseller to her credit. I write on every subject under the sun, she had breathlessly confided to Neve on the opening day of the shop. I take the fresh approach, the inquiring look, about sex, politics, nursing homes, and... She had run out of breath, her navy blue eyes snapping, her white blonde hair flying around her face. The trouble is that I work so hard at what I do, I don't have a minute for myself. If I buy a black dress, I end up wearing brown shoes with it. You have everything here. Put me together. In the last six years, Ethel Lamston had become a valuable customer. She insisted Neve pick out every stitch she bought as well as choosing accessories and compiling lists to tell her what went with what. She lived in a brownstone in the West 80s and Neve stopped there occasionally to help Ethel decide what clothes to keep from year to year. The last time Neve had gone over Ethel's wardrobe was three weeks ago. The next day Ethel had come in and ordered the new outfits. 
Neve, I've almost finished that fashion article I interviewed you for. A lot of people are going to be mad at me when it comes out. Anyway, you'll get lots of publicity. When she made her selection, she and Neve had differed on one suit. Neve had started to take it away. I don't want to sell you that. It's a Gordon Stuber. I cannot stand that man. I refuse to handle his designs any longer. This one should have gone back. <laughs> Wait till you read what I wrote about him. I crucified him, but I still want the suit. His clothes look good on me. Now, as Neve carefully placed the garments in heavy protective bags, she felt her lips narrow at the sight of the Stuber outfit. Six weeks ago, the daily maid at the shop had asked her to speak to a friend who was in trouble. The friend, a Mexican, told Neve about working in an illegal sweatshop that was owned by Gordon Stuber. We don't have green cards. He threatens to turn us in. Last week I was sick. He fired me and my daughter and won't pay us what he owes. The young woman looked to be in her late twenties. Your daughter? How old is she? Fourteen. Neve had cancelled her orders with Gordon Stuber and sent him a scathing letter. Someone in Stuber's office had tipped off women's wear daily. The editors printed Neve's letter and called on other retailers to boycott manufacturers who were breaking the law. Anthony de la Salva had been upset. Neve, the word is that Stuber has a lot more than sweatshops to hide. Thanks to what you've stirred up, the feds are nosing around his income tax returns. Wonderful! If he's cheating at that too, I hope they catch him. Well, she decided as she straightened the Stuber suit on the hanger, this will be the last thing of his that comes into my shop. Neve had realized early on that even though Ethel might be a talkative, seemingly scatterbrained woman, she was also an excellent writer. Ethel's fashion article was due out soon in Contemporary Woman, the magazine where she was a contributing editor. Neve was anxious to read it. Neve made up the lists for Ethel: blue silk evening suit, wear white silk blouse, jewelry in box A, three-piece pink and gray ensemble, gray pumps, matching purse, jewelry in box B, black cocktail dress. There were eight outfits in all. With the accessories, they came to nearly seven thousand dollars. Ethel spent that amount three or four times a year. She'd confided to Neve that when she was divorced twenty-two years before, she'd gotten a big settlement and invested it wisely. And I collect a thousand bucks a month alimony from him for life. <laughs> At the time we broke up, he was riding high. He told his lawyers it was worth every cent to get rid of me. In court, he said that if I ever marry again, the guy should be stone deaf. Maybe I'd have given him a break if it weren't for that crack. He's remarried and has three kids, and ever since Columbus Avenue got classy, his bar has been in trouble. Every once in a while, he phones and begs me to let him off the hook, but I tell him I still haven't found anyone who's stone deaf. At that moment, Neve had been prepared to dislike Ethel. Then Ethel had added, "I always wanted a family. We separated when I was thirty-seven. The five years we were married, he wouldn't give me a child." With a sigh of relief, Neve stapled the bottoms of the garment bags and dialed Ethel's apartment. There was no answer. Nor had Ethel left her answering machine on. Neve decided that Ethel would probably arrive any minute, breathless and with a taxi waiting. She tried Ethel at four thirty, at five, at five thirty. Now what? She wondered. Then she had an idea. She'd call a taxi, wait until closing time, then deliver Ethel's things on her way home. Surely she could leave them with the superintendent. That way, if Ethel had imminent travel plans, she'd have her new wardrobe. There was no answer at Ethel's apartment. Neve rang in vain for the superintendent. Finally, she wrote a note to slip under Ethel's door. Then, struggling under the weight of the bags, she got back in the cab. Inside Ethel Lamston's apartment, his hand reached for Neve's note, read it, tossed it aside, and resumed his search for the hundred-dollar bills that Ethel regularly squirreled away under the carpets or between the cushions of the couch, the money she gleefully referred to as Seamus the Wimp's alimony. At six o'clock, Miles Carney began to prepare dinner in an effort to shake off the nagging worry that had been growing in him. At six thirty, he began to actively worry about Neve. He called the shop, but there was no answer. 
By the time she'd struggled in with the bundles of clothes, he'd been ready to call the police. Miles, I tell you, Ethel Lamston may be a good customer, but she's also a royal pain in the neck. Ethel Lamston? Isn't she the ditz you had at the party? You've got it. On impulse, Neve had invited Ethel to the annual Christmas party she and Miles gave in the apartment. After pinning Bishop Devon Stanton to the wall and explaining why the Catholic Church was no longer relevant in the 20th century, Ethel had attached herself to Miles when she realized he was a widower. I don't care if you have to camp outside her door for the next two years. Don't let that woman set foot in this place again. It was not Denny Adler's idea of a good time to be breaking his neck for tips delivering for the deli. But Denny knew that if he didn't have a job, he couldn't spend a dime with his probation officer asking him what he was living on, so he worked and hated every minute of it. What the parole officer didn't know that most of Denny's time away from the job was spent panhandling on the street. He changed both the locations and his disguises every few days, picking up a lot of loose pocket change that way. Nothing like the thrill of planning a real job, but it was something to keep his hand in. His probation would be finished in three months, then he'd be free to drop out of sight and decide where the best action was to be found. He was interrupted from a daydream of what he might do by the deli manager shouting, Hey, Adler, I told you no personal calls during business hours. He slammed the phone into Denny's hand. Hello, Denny. He recognized the voice immediately. Big Charlie Santino, a man with important mob connections. Yeah? Tomorrow, eleven o'clock, Bryant Park behind the library. Watch for the eighty-four black Chevy. Saturday was a busy day at the shop. Neve's eyes sparkled as she watched her clerks write up formidable sales slips. Once again, she silently blessed Sal for staking her six years ago. At two o'clock, Eugenia, a former black fashion model, now Neve second in command, phoned in their lunch order. Ten minutes later, when it was delivered to her office, Neve realized she was starving. The best tuna salad in New York, Denny, she told the delivery man. If you say so, Miss Carney. His pale face creased into an ingratiating smile. While she hurried through lunch, Neve dialed Ethel's number. Once again, no answer. Throughout the afternoon, she tried to reach her. At the end of the day, Neve told Eugenia, I'll take this stuff home once more and keep trying Ethel's phone over the weekend. I sure don't want to waste my Sunday having to come back here because Ethel suddenly decides she's got a plane to catch and needs everything in ten minutes. Knowing her, Neve, she'd have the plane make a special trip to the gate if she missed it. They both laughed, but then Eugenia said, You know those crazy feelings you get sometimes, Neve? I swear they're catching. Pain in the neck that Ethel is, she never pulled anything like this before. The persistent ringing of the phone in Ethel Lamston's apartment did not go unnoticed. Douglas Brown, Ethel's 28-year-old nephew, had moved into the apartment on Friday afternoon. He'd hesitated about taking the risk, but he'd been forced out of his illegal sublet. The frequent calls irritated him, but he did not want to advertise his presence. Besides, Ethel never wanted him to answer her phone. None of your business who calls me, Douglas. He was also sure it had been a wise decision not to answer the doorbell on Friday evening. That note slipped under the door about the clothes must have been the errand Ethel had scheduled for him. Precisely at eleven o'clock on Sunday morning, the black Chevy pulled over. Denny Adler opened the passenger door and slid in. The car was moving even as he yanked the door closed. Charlie pulled an envelope from his inside pocket. Ten thousand, Denny. The same when the job is finished. Denny accepted the envelope, taking sensual pleasure in its bulk. Who? You deliver lunch to her a couple of times a week. She lives in Schwab House, usually walks to and from work, cuts through Central Park. Grab her bag and waste her. Clean out the wallet so it looks like a junkie cutter. If you can't nail her in the park, the garment center might be it. She goes there every Monday afternoon. Those streets are packed. Brush by her, shove her in front of a truck. Take your time. It gotta look like an accident or a mugging. Follow her around in one of those panhandler outfits of yours. For Charlie, it had been a long speech. 
Who? Neve Carney. Then he could feel the perspiration on his brow. To refuse it meant that he'd never see another sunrise. He pocketed the money. Charlie, got any idea who ordered the job? She don't seem like the kind to get in anyone's way. Sepetti got sprung. Sounds like he's got a memory. You're a small-time, small-minded bum, Denny, and some things are none of your business. Now get out. And remember, it can't look like a deliberate hit. Over the snowy weekend, Seamus Lamston, Ethel's ex-husband, had huddled alone in the family apartment on West End Avenue. On Friday afternoon, he had called his bartender. I'm sick. Get Maddie to fill in till Monday. He'd slept soundly Friday night, the sleep of the emotionally spent, but woke up on Saturday with a sense of dread. Ruth had driven up to Boston Thursday. Jeanie, the youngest of their three daughters, was a freshman at the University of Massachusetts. The check Seamus sent for spring semester had bounced. Ruth had gotten an emergency loan from her office and rushed up with a replacement. After Jeanie's distraught call, they'd had a row that must have been heard five blocks away. They'd confronted each other, frightened, exhausted, hopeless. He'd been shamed by the look of distaste in her eyes. Sixty-two years old. He had a pot belly that wouldn't go away. His once thick, sandy hair was thinning and dirty yellow. His reading glasses accentuated the puffiness of his face. He sometimes looked at the picture of Ruth and himself on their wedding day. Both in handsome suits, both pushing forty, second marriages for both of them, happy, eager for each other. The bar had been doing great, and Ruth's quiet, tidy ways were like a sanctuary after putting up with Ethel. Peace is worth every nickel it will cost, he told the lawyer, who didn't want him to agree to lifetime alimony. Ruth's once slender body had grown stocky. As the rent for the bar doubled and tripled and the old customers moved away, her serene face had taken on a look of perpetual worry. These last years with the college expenses had been excruciating, and that thousand dollars a month to Ethel until she married or died had become a bone of contention, a bone that Ruth gnawed at incessantly. The latest outburst last week had been the worst. Ruth read in the post that Ethel had just signed a book contract for a half-million-dollar advance. Ethel was quoted as saying the tell-all book would be a stick of dynamite thrown into the fashion world. For Ruth, that was the last straw. That and the bounce check. You go see her. Tell her that I'm going to the columnist and tell them she's bleeding you dry. Twelve thousand dollars a year for over twenty years... Don't you think her fancy magazines might take exception to one of their feminist editors blackmailing her ex-husband? It's not blackmail, it's alimony. But yes, I'll see her. At noon on Sunday, Seamus stirred himself from his lethargy and began to clean the apartment. Ruth was due back in the late Sunday afternoon. By four o'clock, the shabby apartment was in fairly decent shape. The closer the time came for Ruth to arrive, the more his hands trembled. Would she notice anything different about him? She got home at 5.15. The traffic was terrible. Ruth accepted the glass of wine he handed her and took a long swallow. Well, let's have it. Did you see her? A great weariness came over Seamus, the memory of that final scene. Yes, I saw her. And? He chose his words carefully. You were right. She doesn't want it to leak out that she's been collecting alimony from me all these years. She's going to let me off the hook. Ruth set down the wine glass, her face transfigured. I don't believe it. How did you talk her into it? Seamus recalled Ethel's taunting, derisive laugh at his threatening and begging words. The jolt of primitive anger that had gone through him, the look of terror in her eyes. Her final threat, oh, God. Now when Ethel buys her precious Neve Carney clothes and eats high on the hog, you won't be paying. (laughs)
On Monday morning, Neve was in the Schwab House lobby, her arms once again filled with Ethel's clothes, when Tsitsi, a young actress, emerged from the elevator. She shared a studio apartment with another aspiring actress and filled out her family's grudgingly small allowance with odd jobs. Neve knew Tsitsi cleaned for Ethel Lamston's place several times a month. Now she regarded her as a messenger from heaven. I'm supposed to clean there tomorrow, Neve, Cece explained breathlessly. Honest to God, that place is enough to drive me back to walking pit bulls. No matter how tidy I leave it, the next time it's always in a shambles. Look, if Ethel doesn't pick up this stuff today, I'll take you there in a cab tomorrow morning and leave everything in her closet. You have a key, I guess. She gave me one about six months ago. Let me know. Cece blew Neve a kiss and started jogging down the street. Monday was Denny Adler's day off. He had planned to spend it following Neve Carney, but on Sunday evening, the manager of the deli phoned to tell Denny he'd have to come into work the next day. The counterman had quit. Denny swore silently, but it would be stupid to refuse. I'll be there. As he hung up, he thought of Neve Carney, the smile she'd given him the day he delivered lunch, the way that coal black hair framed her face the way her breasts filled out the fancy sweater she'd been wearing. As he turned to walk the dank, urine-smelling hallway back to his room, he thought, You won't get to be Monday's child, Carney. Monday afternoon was Neve's usual time to spend on 7th Avenue. She loved the bizarre bedlam of the garment district, the crowded sidewalks, the delivery trucks double-parked on the narrow streets, the agile delivery boys manipulating racks of clothes through the traffic, the sense of everyone rushing, no time to spare. She'd begun coming here with Renata when she was about eight years old. Over Miles' amused objections, Renata had gotten a part-time job in a neighborhood dress shop. Before long, the aging owner turned over to her the job of buying for the shop. Neve could still hear Renata's fashion philosophy. When a woman dresses, her clothes should fit like a second skin. As Neve wended her way from 7th Avenue through the West 30s, Renata once again drifted into her mind. Renata, so slender and tall, in a black velvet Victor Costa gown, around her throat a pearl necklace with a cluster of small diamonds, her jet black hair piled in a chignon, off to a New Year's Eve party with Miles. That moment had imprinted on her memory. The next New Year's Eve, a few people came to the apartment. Father Devin Stanton, who was now a bishop, Uncle Sal, who was still struggling to make his mark as a designer, and Herb Schwartz, Miles' deputy commissioner. Renata had been dead seven weeks. Neve realized that darkness had begun to fall and headed for her usual visit to Uncle Sal. Anthony Della Salva, nay Salvatore Esposito from the Bronx, was a designer on a par with Bill Blass, Calvin Klein, and Oscar de la Renta. To Neve's dismay, as she crossed 37th Street, she came face to face with Gordon Stuber. Meticulously dressed in a tan cashmere jacket over a brown and beige Scottish pullover, dark brown slacks and Gucci loafers, he could easily have had a successful career as a model. Instead, in his early forties, he was a shrewd businessman with an uncanny knack of hiring unknown young designers and exploiting them. He made plenty of money without having to cheat illegal workers, Neve thought as she stared coldly at him. And if, as Sal hinted, he was an income tax trouble, good. They passed each other without speaking, but it seemed to Neve that anger seemed to emanate from his person. She had heard that people emitted an aura. I don't want to know the color of his aura right now, she thought as she hurried to Sal's office. Anthony Della Salva's cherubic face beamed as he hurried to embrace her. Neve smiled as she took in Sal's outfit. He was his own best ad for his spring line of menswear. His version of a safari outfit was a cross between a paratrooper's jumpsuit and jungle gym at his best. I love it. It will be all over East Hampton next month, she said approvingly as she kissed him. It already is, darling. It's even the rage in Iowa City. That frightens me a little. I must be slipping. His smile was beatific. His round face had become puffy in the last years, and now his eyes crinkled till they were lost under his heavy lids. He and Miles and the bishop had grown up in the same Bronx neighborhood, played stickball, and gone to high school together. 
it was hard to believe that he too was sixty-eight years old. How's Miles? I see Nicky Cipetti got sprung Friday. I suppose that's tearing his guts out. He was upset Friday, but pretty good over the weekend. Now I'm not sure. Invite me up to dinner this week. I haven't seen him for a month. You're on. Neve glanced around the room. The wall covering behind the desk was executed in a mural of the Pacific Reef motif, the design that had made Sal famous. Sal often told her about his inspiration for that line. I was in the aquarium in Chicago. It was 1972. Fashion was a mess that year. I was just wandering around the aquarium and went up to the floor with the Pacific Reef exhibit. It was like walking underwater. The colors, the patterns and designs, and the flow, the grace of movement. I thought, if I could only do this with fabric. I started sketching right on the spot. I knew it was great. I won the Cody Award that year. I turned the fashion industry around. Couturier sales were fantastic, licenses for the mass market and accessories, and all because I was smart enough to copy Mother Nature. Now he followed Neve's gaze. It's still the best thing I ever did, but don't tell anyone. They haven't caught up with me yet. Next week I'll give you a preview of my fall line. The second best thing I've ever done. Sensational. How's your love life? It isn't. What about that guy you had to dinner a couple of months ago? He was crazy about you. I keep telling Miles, and I'll tell you, when Mr. Wright comes along, I'll know it. Don't wait too long, Neve. You've been raised on the fairy tale romance of your mother and father. For most of us, it don't work like that. Neve had a fleeting moment of amusement, reflecting that when Sal was with close friends and ready to wax eloquent, the suave Italian accent disappeared and his native jargon took over. Didn't it happen that way for you four times, Uncle Sal? Don't be so fresh. I'm an optimist. Neve got up feeling immensely cheered. How's Thursday for dinner? Fine. And remember, I'm not on Miles' diet and don't say I should be. The next morning, vigorous bell ringing did not elicit a response at Ethel's apartment. Tsitsi opened the door, and with a sigh of relief, Neve dropped the armful of clothes on the couch. There is a god after... A muscular young man was standing in the foyer, obviously in the process of dressing. His pale green eyes, set in a face that with a different expression might have been attractive, were narrowed by an annoyed frown. Who are you? And why didn't you answer the door? I think the first question is mine, and I answer the door when I choose to answer it. Tsitsi took over. You are Miss Lamston's nephew, Douglas Brown. I've seen your photograph. I know who I am. Would you mind telling me who you are? I'm Neve Carney, and this is Tsitsi. She cleans the apartment for Miss Lamston. Do you mind telling me where Ethel Lamston is? So you're Neve Carney. Number three shoes go with beige suit. Carry number three purse and wear box A jewelry. Do you do that for everyone? Neve felt her jaw harden. Miss Lamston is a very good customer and a very busy woman. And I'm a very busy woman. Is she here? And if not, when is she coming back? Douglas Brown shrugged. Something of the animosity left him. I have no idea where my aunt is. She asked me to meet her here on Friday afternoon. When there was no answer, I let myself in. She hasn't been here. I just lost my sublet, and the why isn't my speed, so I made up the couch and stayed. There was something too glib about the explanation, Neve thought. I was here early Friday evening. What time did you say you arrived? About three. Douglas Brown slipped his tie over his neck. I've got to get to work. Just leave Ethel's clothes, Miss Carney. He turned to Tsitsi. And if you can find some way to clean this place up, that's fine, too. I'll pile my stuff together just in case Ethel decides to favor us with her presence. Now he seemed in a hurry to get away. Just a minute. You must have been here when I was trying to deliver these clothes. Would you mind explaining why you wouldn't answer the door that night? What time did you get here? Around seven. I'd gone out for something to eat. Sorry. He disappeared into the bedroom and pushed the door closed. 
Neve and Tsitsi looked at each other. Tsitsi shrugged. I might as well get busy. Neve, you don't suppose anything happened to Ethel, do you? I've thought about having Miles call for accident reports, although I must say the loving nephew doesn't seem frantic with worry. At that moment, Douglas Brown emerged from the bedroom. He seemed surprised and not pleased that Neve was still there. I thought you were so busy. Are you planning to help clean? Neve's lips narrowed ominously. I'm planning to hang these clothes in your aunt's closet, and then I intend to leave. He was gone. Neve and Tsitsi looked at each other. What a creep, Tsitsi said. And to think he's poor Ethel's only relative. Two weeks ago, when I last cleaned here, she was on the phone with him and real upset. Ethel squirrels money around the apartment, and she thought some of it was missing. She practically accused him of stealing it. The dusty, crowded apartment suddenly made Neve feel claustrophobic. She wanted out of this place. Let's get these clothes put away. If Douglas Brown had slept on the couch the first night, it was clear he had been using Ethel's bedroom since then. There was an ashtray full of cigarettes on the night table. Ethel didn't smoke. Several men's suits, sports jackets, and slacks were draped over a chaise lounge. A man's suitcase was on the floor. At least he didn't have the nerve to disturb Ethel's closet, Neve observed. The back wall of the bedroom consisted of an elaborate built-in closet that ran the length of the room. When Ethel first asked Neve to go through her closet, Neve had told her that it was no wonder she never could put any outfits together. She needed more closet space. Three weeks later, Ethel had invited Neve back. She had led her to the bedroom and proudly displayed her new acquisition, a custom-built closet that had cost her $10,000. It had short poles for blouses, high poles for evening gowns. It was sectioned off so that coats hung in one area, suits in another, daytime dresses in another. There were shelves for sweaters and purses, racks for shoes, a jewelry unit to hold necklaces and bracelets. In contrast to the rest of the apartment, the closet was exquisitely neat. On the inside of the door, Ethel had pasted the lists Neve had given her, which accessories to wear with which outfits. As Neve sorted and hung the new garments, she skimmed the contents of the closet. Ethel's sable coat, her stone martin jacket, the red cashmere coachman coat, the Burberry, the herringbone cape, the white... Wait a minute. She peered up at the top shelf. She knew Ethel's Vuitton luggage consisted of four matching pieces. All were missing. Good old Ethel, she did take off. That beige ensemble with the mink collar is gone. She began poking through the racks. She took everything she needed to get all gussied up. I guess the weather was so lousy she decided she didn't need light spring things. Well, wherever she is, I hope it hits 90 degrees. For some reason, Neve's nagging feeling that something was wrong about Ethel's sudden departure stayed with her. It accompanied her when she rushed to the cocktail party in the St. Regis given by Women's Wear Daily. In the glitter of the fashionably dressed crowd, she spotted Tony Mendel, the elegant editor-in-chief of Contemporary Woman, and hurried over to her. Do you know how long Ethel will be gone? I'm surprised she isn't here, Neve. She said she'd be coming, but then we all know Ethel. When is her fashion article due? She turned it in Thursday morning. It's about the great looks of the last 50 years and the designers behind them. I had to have the lawyers go over to make sure we don't get sued. They made us cut out a few things, but it's still wonderful. Ethel makes everything fun and gossipy. You heard about the big contract she has with Gibbons and Marks? Well, two weeks ago she got terribly mysterious. I gather she charged into Jack Campbell's office and talked him into a contract for a book on fashion with a six-figure advance. She's probably holed up somewhere writing it. Neve began to edge away, but Tony stopped her. Neve, Jack Campbell just came in. He's that tall guy in the gray suit. Maybe he knows where you can reach Ethel. By the time Neve had made her way across the room, Jack Campbell was already surrounded. She waited, listening to the congratulations he was accepting. From the gist of the conversation, she gathered that he had just been made president and publisher of Gibbons and Marks, that he had bought an apartment, and that he was sure he'd thoroughly enjoy living in New York. She judged him to be in his late thirties, young for the job. His hair was dark brown and cut short. 
His body had the lean, taut look of a runner. His face was thin, his eyes the same dark brown as his hair. His smile seemed genuine. She liked the way he bent his head forward to listen. There was something about Jack Campbell that seemed familiar. She felt she'd met him before. But where? It's Neve, isn't it? In the moment she had turned away, Jack Campbell had come over to her. Chicago, six years ago, you were coming back from skiing and I'd been on a sales trip. We started talking five minutes before the plane landed. You were all excited about opening a dress shop. How did it work out? Fine. Neve vaguely remembered the exchange. She'd bolted out of the plane to make her connecting flight. Weren't you just starting work for a new publisher? Yes, I... The editor-in-chief of W was plucking his sleeve. I don't want to keep you, Jack. I understand Ethel Lamston is writing a book for you. Do you know where I can reach her? I have her home number. Will that help? Thanks, but I have it, too. Neve lifted her hand in a quick, self-deprecating gesture. I mustn't hold you up. She turned and slipped through the crowd, suddenly weary of the babble of voices and conscious that it had been a long day. The usual cluster of people waiting for cabs crowded the sidewalk. Neve shrugged, walked to Fifth Avenue, and started uptown. But at Central Park South, a cab deposited a fare directly in front of her. She hesitated, then got in. The idea of walking another mile in high heels was suddenly distinctly unattractive. She did not see the frustrated expression on Denny's face. He had waited patiently outside the St. Regis and followed her up Fifth. When she began to head for the park, he thought his opportunity had come at last. At two o'clock that morning, Neve awakened from a sound sleep. She had been dreaming that she was standing in front of Ethel's closet making a list. That was it. Coats. They were all there. Ethel had turned in her article on Thursday. No one had seen her on Friday. Both days had been windy and miserably cold. There had been a snowstorm on Friday. But every one of Ethel's winter coats was still in place in her closet. Nicky Cipetti shivered in the cable-lit cardigan his wife had made for him the year he went to prison. Seventeen years that ended last Friday. His first deep breath outside prison walls brought on waves of chest pain. The doctors had warned him about his heart. The guys were coming to pick him up. They'd have a celebration lunch on Mulberry Street. A sign of respect to him, but he didn't kid himself. The word was out that he was sick. They'd complete what they'd started in these last years. Ease him out. Joey had been sentenced with him. Same amount of time, but Joey got out in six years. Joey was in charge now. Miles Carney. He could thank Carney for those extra twelve years. The private room at the restaurant was ready for them. Nicky felt himself start to relax, felt some of the old power flow into his body. He waited until dessert was served before he looked from face to face of the ten men who were sitting like tin soldiers. Two of the faces were new to him. One was okay. The other Nicky studied carefully. He was introduced as Carmen Machado. Instinctively, Nicky did not trust him. He'd buttoned Joey down on how much they knew about him. His eyes came to rest on Joey. Joey, who had gotten out in six years, who had taken over control while he, Nicky, was locked up. Nicky realized his chest was burning. Okay, so tell me, Joey, what's on your mind? With respect, I got great news for you. We all know how you feel about that son of a bitch, Carney. Well, there's a contract out on his daughter. And it's not ours. Gordon Stuber is going to waste her. It's almost like a gift to you. You stupid bastards. He had a momentary impression of Carmen Machado and suddenly knew he was looking into the face of a cop. Nicky knew if Carney's daughter got hit, the cops wouldn't stop till they hung it on him. And Joey knew that. You stinking, stupid bastards. Get it called off, Joey, understand? Nicky, you know that's impossible. Nobody can cancel a contract. Zepetti's chest was aflame with waves of pain. 
Within 15 minutes, Nicky was on his way home, frustrated, angry, and depressed. Drearily, he reflected he'd been a fool to warn Joey about Machado's being a cop. Oh, sure, the family paid him respect, but Nicky knew he was out. On Tuesday morning, Seamus Lamston woke from four hours of sleep that had been plagued with dreams of Ethel's face. The way her eyes bulged when she was angry, the sardonic smile that he'd eradicated from her face. When he'd arrived at her place on Thursday afternoon, he'd pulled out a snapshot of the girls. Ethel, look at them. They need the money I pay you. Give me a break. They should have been mine, Seamus. Now his stomach squeezed in apprehension. His alimony payment was due on the 5th, tomorrow. Did he dare not write the check? It was 7.30. Ruth was already up. Seamus put off the agony of decision about Ethel's check by writing some others. Ruth came into the den smiling, and for an instant Seamus was reminded of the quietly pretty woman he'd married. Seeing you write the monthly checks makes it really sink in. No more money to Ethel. Oh, God, Seamus, we can finally begin to breathe. Seamus felt the muscles in his stomach twist. Honey, I just hope she doesn't change her mind. I mean, I haven't anything in writing. Do you think I should just send the check as usual and let her return it? Then we'd have something legal, proof that she said it was okay to stop paying. His voice choked to a gasp as a stinging slap snapped his head over his shoulder. He looked up and winced at the murderous outrage on Ruth's face. He had seen that look on another face only a few days ago. No more checks. Let her try to go back on her word. I'll kill her myself rather than let you pay her another dime. Over breakfast on Wednesday morning, Neve told Miles about her concern over Ethel. She voiced the thoughts that had kept her awake half the night. Neve, that woman will live forever. I can just see God and the devil telling each other, take her, she's yours. Miles smiled, enjoying his joke. Neve made a face at him, exasperated that he was not taking her concern seriously, but grateful for the bantering tone. You seem pretty chipper today. Does that mean you've stopped worrying about Nikki Cipetti? Let's just say I spoke to her, but I'm satisfied that Nikki won't be able to brush his teeth without one of our boys gazing at his cavities. And they say he's pretty sick. Hasn't much fight left. Well, as long as you stop fussing over me. Miles, I know Ethel's wardrobe like the back of my hand. She vanished in bitterly cold weather without a coat. How would you explain that? Let's assume that Ethel saw a coat in a shop window and decided it was just what she wanted. Anyway, Neve, you should be thinking about more important things like going out on dates. Look, Miles, I go out a lot. When someone important comes along, I'll know it just the way you and Mother did. By the time Neve had showered and dressed in a boxy cocoa brown cashmere jacket with bracelet sleeves and turned-backed cuffs and a softly gathered wool mid-calf skirt, she had recognized the fallacy in Miles' thinking. Neve knew that Ethel wouldn't purchase a coat from anyone else. Douglas Brown awakened early on Wednesday and began to expand his domination over Ethel's apartment. It had been a pleasant surprise on returning from work last night to find it sparkling clean and as reasonably tidy as any human being could make it, given Ethel's massive piles of paper. That realization suddenly brought on a frown. The money. Had that actress kid who cleaned found the money? He'd left a single one hundred dollar bill under the carpet near the wing chair. It was still there. Ethel could be such a dope, he reflected. When that alimony check would come in, she'd have it cashed into $100 bills. My mad money, Doug. They're eating beans and we're dining on caviar. Sometimes they go through it all in a month. Sometimes it piles up. Every so often I look around and send the leftover bucks to my accountant towards clothes. Restaurants and clothes. That's what the stupid wimp has kept me in all these years. Doug had laughed with her, clinking glasses as they toasted Seamus the wimp. That night he'd realized that Ethel never kept track of how much cash she had hidden around and so would never miss a few hundred bucks, which was what he'd been helping himself to these last two years. A couple of times she'd half suspected, but the minute she'd say anything he'd act indignant and she'd back right down. 
If you just write down when you spend that money, Aunt Ethel, you'd see where it goes. He blotted out the memory of that last conversation when she demanded that he run an errand for her on Friday and told him not to expect a tip. I took your advice and kept track of what I spent. Doug methodically went through the papers in Ethel's desk. As he flipped through a folder marked important, his face drained of color. That old windbag Ethel had blue chip stocks. She had property in Florida. She had a million dollar life insurance policy. There was a copy of her will in the last section of the folder. He couldn't believe his eyes when he read it. Everything, every single dime she had, had been left to him, and she was worth a bundle. Later that day, Neve was on the telephone with Titi. I have to get back into Ethel's apartment, and I want to avoid the nephew. I know she has an appointment book in her desk. I'd just like to have some kind of idea about what plan she may have made before she disappeared. They agreed to meet the next morning in the lobby. At closing time, Neve phoned the Cardinal's residence and was put through to Bishop Devon Stanton. I got your message, Neve. I'll be delighted to come up to dinner tomorrow night. Sal's coming? Good, the three musketeers from the Bronx don't get to see each other enough these days. Haven't seen Sal since Christmas. Has he gotten married again by any chance? Just before he said goodbye, the bishop reminded Neve that his favorite dish was her pasta al pesto. The only one who could make it better was your mother, God rest her. Neve replaced the receiver, turned off the lights, and left the shop. The capricious April weather had turned cool again, but even so she felt the absolute need for a long walk. She was just turning into the park when a squad car pulled up. Neve recognized the police officer who had once been Miles' driver. She stopped to chat with him. A few paces behind her, Denny halted abruptly. He was wearing a long, nondescript overcoat with a collar turned up and a stocking cap. Although his face was almost concealed, Denny knew that the cop might have recognized him. This job was worth more than he was being paid. When Neve Carney went down, 40,000 New York cops would be on a manhunt. Kitty Conway had joined the riding class at Morrison State Park for only one reason. She needed to fill time with more activities. Michael had been gone for nearly three years. She was a pretty woman of 58, with russet hair and gray eyes that were enhanced by the fine lines that edged and framed them, a woman who had retained her good looks. Kitty gingerly hoisted herself up on the chestnut mare and gamely fell in with the dozen other student riders behind the instructor. It was a steep climb up the trail. Her horse constantly stopped to eat along the way. One by one, the others in the group passed her. She didn't want to get separated from them. Come on, damn you! She kicked her heels against the horse's flanks. In a sudden, violent movement, the mare threw back her head, then reared. Startled, Kitty pulled at the reins as the animal swerved into a side path. She felt the horse stumble as a rock gave way under its hind leg. It started to pitch forward, then regained its balance. A piece of black plastic flew up and grazed Kitty's cheek. She looked down and had a fleeting impression of a hand framed by a bright blue cuff. Gratefully reclining in a hot tub, Kitty relived the harrowing experience. The worst part had been when that miserable nag slipped. The image of the plastic flying past her face returned. And then, that impression of a woolen sleeve. How ridiculous. But still, she had seen it, hadn't she? Seamus had felt chilled to the soul. He had been acutely aware of Ruth's eyes boring into him as he recalled their latest confrontation. I told you to put it in writing, Seamus. Thank her for agreeing that you need the money and she doesn't. Tell her that in these 22 years you've paid her nearly a quarter of a million dollars, as well as a big settlement, and it's obscene to want more for a marriage that lasted less than six years. And if she squawks, there won't be a person alive who doesn't know what a greedy phony she is. Ethel thrives on threats, Ruth. She'd turn a letter like that around. She'd make the alimony payment sound like triumph for womankind. It's a mistake. Write it. Then march yourself over and stick it in her mailbox. His head sunk in misery, his hands jammed in his pockets. 
Seamus fingered the two envelopes he was carrying. One held a check. He had written it without Ruth's knowledge. The letter was in the other envelope. Which one should he put in Ethel's box? A kid he recognized as living on the fourth floor of Ethel's building brushed past him as he started up the stoop. Excuse me, would you mind if I went into the lobby with you? I have to put something in Miss Lamston's mailbox. Sure, I know who you are. You're her ex. It must be the fifth of the month. That's what she always says you deliver the ransom. <laughs> the murderous rage washed over him again. So he was the laughing stock of the building. You're just on time. Ethel told my mother she yanks you right into court when you're late with the check. Panic swept over Seamus. Clearly, it would have to be the check. He grabbed the envelope from his pocket and forced it down the narrow slit. When he arrived home, he nodded yes to Ruth's fiercely angry question. He could not have withstood the explosion that would have occurred had he admitted the truth. He hung up his coat and took the second envelope from his pocket, glancing inside. It was empty. He had put the check and the letter in the same envelope, and now both were in Ethel's mailbox. Nicky Cipetti spent Wednesday morning in bed. The burning in his chest was even worse than last night. From far away, he heard the doorbell ringing, a hard and demanding sound. The bedroom door swung open. Through glazed eyes, he saw the shock on his wife's face, heard her shriek. Other faces. Cops. They didn't have to be in uniform. He could smell them even as he was dying. Then he knew why they were there. That undercover guy he fingered. Machado, the one he heard Joey had wasted. Of course. Right away the cops had come to him, to Nicky Cepetti. On my mother's grave... I didn't order Carney's wife killed. He wanted to add that he tried to stop the contract on Carney's daughter. But all he managed to cry was, Mama, before a last blinding, tearing pain ripped through his chest. How many people had Big Mouth Ethel told that she thought he was helping himself to her money? It was a question that haunted Doug. So on Wednesday, he waited impatiently on the interminable line at the bank and got four $100 bills. He'd stash them in some of Ethel's hiding places. That way, if anybody searched, the money would be there. Doug had been collecting the mail every day. Even so, the box was jammed, one envelope still sticking out a little. Doug casually flipped through the envelopes and dumped them on Ethel's desk. After dinner, Need began to organize the next night's dinner party. Renata's cookbooks were on the shelf over the kitchen sink. She reached for her favorite, an old family relic with northern Italian recipes. For years, she'd avoided the cookbooks, unwilling to see the notations in Renata's bold, curlicued hand. Renata had drawn quick sketches of Neve on the margins of the pages, sketches that were charming, beautifully drawn miniatures. Neve dressed as a princess sitting at the table. Neve hovering over a large mixing bowl. Neve dressed in a Gibson girl dress sampling a cookie. Dozens of sketches, each one evoking a sense of profound loss in her. Even now, Neve could not allow herself to do more than skim her eyes over them. The memories they recalled were too painful. She recalled how annoyed Miles had been when, during their Christmas party... He found Ethel Lamston in the kitchen browsing through Renata's cookbooks. She'd been holding the book with the sketches. Miles had taken it from her. Now, as Neve was placing serving dishes on the sideboard, the phone rang. Miles picked it up. His genial hello was quickly replaced by rapid fire questions. That was Herb Schwartz. One of our guys, Tony Vitale, had been planted in the Cepetti family's inner circle. He was found in a garbage dump, barely alive. Herb was there in the emergency room. Tony managed to tell him, No contract. Nicky. Neve Carney. He's in a coma now, but they think he'll make it. Now, for the first time in 17 years, I can sleep at night. Miles put his hand over his face as though trying to hide the expression on it. Neve, our guys went to question Nicky. As they got there, the stinking son of a bitch had a heart attack. 
He's dead, Meave. Nicky Cipetti is dead. To himself, Miles whispered a message to Renata. No thanks to me, our little girl is safe at last. On Thursday, the apartment was still surprisingly tidy. Neve walked to Ethel's desk and picked up the appointment book. She flipped the pages until she reached March 31st. In a bold scrawl, Ethel had written, Doug pick up clothes at Neve's. The slot for three o'clock was circled. The notation next to it was, Doug at apartment. Tsitsi was looking over Neve's shoulder. So he's not lying about that. Without answering, Neve flipped through the month of April. All the pages had a line drawn through them. On April 1st, Ethel had written, Research, writing book. She cancelled everything, Cece. She was planning to go away or hole up somewhere and write. Neve began to turn to back dates. The last week of March was crammed with the names of all the prominent designers. Ethel was obviously a doodler. Triangles, hearts, swirls, and drawings covered every inch of the page. On impulse, Neve turned to December 22nd, the day of the Christmas party she and Miles had given. Swirls and twirls accompanied Ethel's comment. Neve's father, single and fascinating. On the side of the page, Ethel had drawn a crude imitation of a sketch from Renata's cookbook. She turned the pages back to the last week in March and began to copy the names Ethel had listed there. Jack Campbell's name jumped out at her. Obviously, the book contract had been all important to Ethel. Maybe she had told Campbell more about her plans than he'd realized. When Neve returned to the shop, her first call was to Jack Campbell. He was in a meeting. She left word for him to return her call. She went down the list of the designers whose names had been scribbled in Ethel's book. The first three she reached hadn't seen Ethel last week. She'd simply called to confirm the direct quote she was attributing to them. One designer summed up the irritation Neve caught in all their voices. Why I let that woman interview me, I'll never know. She kept hammering questions at me till I was dizzy. I practically had to throw her out, and I have a hunch I'm not going to like her damn article. Anthony de la Salva was the next name. She'd see him tonight at dinner. Gordon Stuber. Ethel had confided that she'd crucified him in her article. But when was the last time she saw him? Reluctantly, Neve dialed Stuber's office and was put through immediately to him. He did not waste his time on amenities. What do you want? I've been asked to try to locate Ethel Lamston. It's quite urgent. On a hunch, she added, I know from her appointment book that she met with you last week. Did she give you any indication of where she might have been planning to go? Long seconds passed in total silence. He's trying to decide what to say, she thought. Ethel Lamston tried to interview me weeks ago about an article she was writing. I did not see her. She phoned last week, but I refused to accept her call. I have no time for busybodies. Neve heard a click in her ear. She was about to dial the next designer when her phone rang. It was Jack Campbell. My secretary said your call was urgent, Neve. Is there anything wrong? She suddenly felt ridiculous trying to explain to him that she was worried about Ethel Lamston because the woman hadn't picked up her clothes. Instead, she said, Is there any chance I could talk to you for about half an hour today? Sure, how about three o'clock in my office? Jack Campbell's office was a huge corner room with dazzling views of downtown Manhattan. As she glanced around, Neva praised the man she had come to see. His suit jacket was on the back of his desk chair. He was wearing an argyle sweater in tones of green and brown. It suited him, Neve decided. Autumn colors. His face was too thin, his features too irregular to be deemed handsome, but were infinitely attractive in their quiet strength. There was good-humored warmth in his eyes when he smiled, and Neve found herself glad she was wearing one of her new spring ensembles, a turquoise wool dress and matching stroller-length jacket. She knew he had to have pushed off other appointments to see her so quickly. She took a deep breath and told him about Ethel. Jack Campbell had listened to her with the same attentive posture she had observed at the cocktail party. When Neve asked about Ethel's forthcoming book, Jack offered what he knew. 
Ethel gave me a rundown on the article she was doing and said she might have stumbled across a scandal that would rock the fashion world, a bombshell, and if she wrote a book about it, would I buy it and what kind of advance could she expect? I told her I obviously had to know more about it, but if it was as explosive as she claimed, we'd buy it and we'd probably be talking in a mid-six-figure advance. Then last week I read in the Post that she had a contract with me for half a million dollars and the book would be on the fall list. I've tried phoning Ethel without success. I've neither confirmed nor denied the terms. Ethel's a real publicity hound, and if she writes the book and it's good, all the advanced press is just fine with me. And you don't have any idea what she considered a story that would rock the industry? Not a clue. I've taken enough of your time. I suppose that I should be reassured. She held out her hand to him. Thank you, Jack. He did not release her hand immediately. His smile creased his face. Do you always make such quick getaways? Six years ago, you darted out of the plane like an arrow. The other night when I turned around, you disappeared. Neve withdrew her hand. Occasionally, I slow down to a jog, but now I'd better run and pay attention to my own business. I hear Neve's place is one of the most fashionable shops in New York. Can I get to see it? Sure, any time. And you don't have to buy anything. Good. My mother lives in Nebraska and wears sensible clothes. Neve wondered if that was Jack Campbell's way of telling her that there was no special lady in his life. Seamus left the bar at 4.30. He had to go to Ethel's apartment and he didn't want Ruth to know. There was just one hope. He hadn't stuffed the envelope deep in the mailbox. He might be able to retrieve it. It was a one in a million chance. He was in front of the brownstone. As he stood, uncertain what to do next, the fourth-floor window opened. A woman leaned out. Over her shoulder, he could see the face of the kid he talked to yesterday. She hasn't been around all week. And listen, mister, I almost called the cops last Thursday when I heard you shouting at her. Seamus turned and fled. He did not stop until he was safely inside his own apartment. Only then was he aware of the pounding of his heart, the shuddering sound of his struggle for oxygen. To his dismay, he heard Ruth's footsteps coming from the bedroom. Urgently, he wiped his face and tried to pull himself together. Ruth did not seem to notice his agitation. She was holding his brown suit over his arm. I was going to drop this at the cleaner, Seamus. Would you kindly tell me how in the name of God you came to have a $100 bill in the pocket? Jack Campbell stayed in his office for nearly two hours after Neve left him. Neve Carney. For some reason, he'd never quite forgotten her. At the cocktail party, when she'd approached him, he recognized her immediately. She wasn't a 21-year-old kid in a ski sweater anymore. She was a sophisticated, fashionably dressed young woman. Now Jack found himself wondering if she had a serious involvement. As he left the office, he shrugged. He had known all afternoon that he was going to walk along Madison Avenue to see Neve's place. Several minutes later, he was studying the elegantly dressed windows. He liked what he saw. But looking at the window display made Jack aware of the elusive thought that had evaded him when he was trying to tell Neve exactly what Ethel had pitched to him. Tomorrow he could call her and tell her exactly what Ethel had said. Thursday had been a busy day for Kitty Conway. As she arrived home that evening, she debated about showering and getting comfortable in pajamas and a robe. Instead, she pulled a teal-blue sweatsuit from the closet and reached for her sneakers. I'm back to jogging as of right now. She followed her usual path, a half mile into town, circling the bus station and back home. Feeling pleasantly virtuous, she dropped her sweatsuit and underwear into the bathroom hamper, showered, slipped on lounging pajamas and reached for the bathroom light switch. Her fingers turned numb. The sleeve of her blue sweatsuit was dangling from the hamper. Fear, like a cold blade of steel, made Kitty's throat constrict. Her lips went dry. She could feel the hairs on her neck bristle and tighten. That sleeve. There should be a hand in it. Yesterday, when the horse bolted... That scrap of plastic that had hit her face. 
that blurred image of blue cloth and a hand. She hadn't been crazy. She had seen a hand. When Neve arrived home, she changed into blue silk slacks and a matching long sleeve blouse. Miles' eyes softened when she came into the kitchen. Your mother always looked lovely in that color. You grow more like her every day. Neve reached for Renata's cookbook. In addition to the pasta with pesto, she was serving soles stuffed with shrimp for the entree. She flipped through the book until she reached the page with the sketches. Again, she avoided looking at them. Instead, she concentrated on the handwritten instructions Renata had scrawled over the baking time for the sole. Miles watched as she put caviar toast points on a platter. I never developed a taste for that stuff. Very plebeian of me, I know. You're hardly plebeian, but you are missing a lot. She studied him. A good-looking guy, she thought, and best of all, you'd never dream he'd been so sick. She told him that. I do feel well. In fact, almost fully recovered. And inactivity is getting on my nerves. I'd had some feelers about heading up the Drug Enforcement Agency in Washington. It would mean spending most of my time there. What do you think? Oh, that's wonderful. You could really get your teeth into that job. She knew how Miles deplored the drug traffic and the carnage it was causing. And who knows... In Washington, he might meet someone. He should marry again, and God knows he was a good-looking guy. The doorbell rang as she brought the caviar into the living room. Their two guests had arrived together. Bishop Devin Stanton was one of the few prelates who at private functions seemed more comfortable in a Roman collar than a sports jacket. Behind silver-rimmed glasses, his mild blue eyes radiated warmth and intelligence. Once again, Anthony de la Salva was resplendent in one of his own creations. He was wearing a charcoal gray suit of Italian silk. The elegant lines masked the additional weight that had begun creeping onto his always rotund body. His black hair, untouched by gray, glistened, matching the glass of his Gucci loafers. As usual, Sal was bursting with good humor. Dev, Miles, Neve, my three favorite people, not counting my present girlfriend, but certainly counting my ex-wives. Dev, do you think Mother Church will take me back in when I get old? The prodigal son is supposed to return repentant and in rags, Sal. God, it's good to get together with you two, Miles said. I feel as though we're back at the Bronx. Are you still drinking absolute vodka or have you found something more trendy? The evening began in the usual pleasant, comfortable fashion that had become a ritual. Inevitably, it turned to Nicky Cepetti's death. It was too easy for him dying in bed, Sal commented. After what he did to your pretty one? Neve watched as Miles' lips tightened. Long ago, Sal had heard Miles teasingly call Renata, my pretty one, and to Miles' annoyance had picked it up. How's the pretty one, he would greet Renata, Neve could still remember the moment at Renata's wake when Sal had knelt at the casket, his eyes flowing with tears, then got up, embraced Miles, and said, Try to think your pretty one is sleeping. She's not sleeping, she's dead. And Sal, don't ever call her that again. That was my name for her. Till now, he never had. There was a moment of awkward silence, then Sal gulped the rest of his vodka and headed for the guest bathroom. Devon sighed. He may be a genius designer, but he still has more spit than polish. Over dessert, the talk returned to Renata. This is one of her recipes, Neve told them, prepared especially for you. I've really just started getting into her cookbooks, and it's fun. Sal insisted on helping Neve clear the table and volunteered to prepare the coffee. As he busied himself with the espresso machine, Neve went to get the demitasse cups that had been in the Rossetti family for generations. The sound of a thud and a cry of pain made them rush to the kitchen. The espresso machine had toppled over, flooding the counter and soaking Renata's cookbook. Sal was running his fiery red hand under cold water. His face was ghastly white. The handle on that damn pot came off. Miles, are you trying to get back at me for breaking your arm when we were kids? 
It was obvious the burn was nasty and painful. Neve scrambled for the first aid kit while the bishop began mopping up. Miles was holding the cookbook. Neve saw the expression in his eyes as he stared at Renata's sketches, now thoroughly soaked and stained. Sal noticed as well. He pulled his hand from Neve's ministration. Miles, for God's sake, I'm sorry. Miles held the book over the sink, drained the puddles of coffee from it, and covering it with a towel, laid it carefully on top of the counter. What the hell have you got to be sorry about? Over after-dinner drinks, Neve told about Ethel's apparent disappearance. Miles' comment was, as long as she stays out of sight. Trying not to wince at the pain in his rapidly blistering hand, Sal poured himself another drink. There isn't a designer on 7th Avenue she hasn't bugged about that article. To answer your question, Neve, she phoned me last week with a couple of questions like, was it true I had the school record for playing hooky at Christopher Columbus High School? You've got to be joking, Uncle Sal. No joke at all. My guess is Ethel's article is to debunk all the stories we designers pay publicists to grind out about us. By the way, the word is that your tip about Stuber sweatshops is really turning up a lot of dirt. Listen, Neve, I'd stay away from that guy. When the bishop and Sal left, Neve and Miles stacked the dishwasher in companionable silence. Neve picked up the offending espresso pot. I wonder how Sal's hand is. Well, Neve, I'll bet he won't be making love with his latest fiancé tonight. Did you hear him say he's thinking of getting married again? You're kidding. Who's the lucky lady? I'm not convinced lucky is the word. He certainly had a variety of them. Never married till he made it big and then runs the gamut from a lingerie model to a ballerina to a socialite to a health nut. Moves from Westchester to New Jersey to Connecticut to Steeden's Landing and leaves them all behind in the fancy house. God knows what it's cost him over the years. Will he ever settle down, Miles? Who knows? No matter how many bucks he makes, Sal Esposito is always going to be an insecure kid trying to prove himself. Neve carried the espresso pot to the trash bin. Might as well ditch this before somebody else is scalded. No, leave it. I'll try to fix it someday when I'm watching Jeopardy. Jeopardy. To Neve, the words seemed to hang in the air. Shaking her head impatiently at the thought, she winced as she saw the blistered and smeared pages of Renata's cookbook. On Friday morning, Ruth Lamston left the apartment without saying goodbye to Seamus. She was afraid. Last night he had convulsed in rage. He'd raised his fist and she was sure he was going to hit her. Instead, he'd snatched the hundred-dollar bill and tore it in half. You want to know where I got it? That bitch gave it to me. When I asked her to let me off the hook, she told me that she'd be glad to help me. She'd been too busy to eat out much, so this was left over from last month. Then she didn't tell you to stop sending the checks? The anger on his face had turned to hatred. Maybe I convinced her that any human being can take just so much. Maybe it's something you ought to learn, too. Don't you dare threaten me! Ruth watched horrified as Seamus burst into tears. Sobbing, he told her how he'd put the check with the letter, how the kid who lived upstairs had talked about him. Ethel's whole building thinks I'm a joke. All night Ruth had lain awake, so filled with contempt for Seamus that she could not sleep. Toward morning she realized that the contempt was for herself as well. That woman has turned me into a shrew. It's got to end. She was going to confront Ethel. She should have done it years ago. If Ethel didn't surrender her alimony rights, Ruth would go for her throat. Squaring her shoulders, Ruth adjusted her rimless glasses, unconsciously preparing herself like a fighter about to enter the ring. From inside Ethel's apartment, she could hear the faint sounds of a radio playing. She pressed her index finger firmly on the bell. There was no response. The next time she pressed the bell relentlessly... The door was yanked open. A young man glared at her. What the hell do you want? Sorry. Are you a friend of Aunt Ethel's? Yes, and I must see her. Ruth moved forward, forcing the young man to let her pass. He stepped back, and she was in the living room. 
Doug felt clammy apprehension. There was something about this woman, about the way she was sizing up the apartment, that made him nervous. I'm Ethel's nephew. Do you have an appointment with her? No, but I insist on seeing her immediately. I'm Seamus Lamston's wife, and I'm here to collect his last check. As of now, there's no more alimony being paid. There was a stack of mail on top of the desk. She spotted the stationery the girls had given Seamus for his birthday. I'll take that. Before Doug could stop her, the envelope was in her hand. She ripped it open and pulled out the contents. Scanning them, she shredded the check and returned the note to the envelope. As Doug Brown stared, too startled to protest, she reached into her purse and extracted the pieces of the hundred-dollar bill Seamus had torn. She isn't here, I gather. You have a hell of a nerve. I could have you arrested for this. I wouldn't try. I know what she thinks of you. You eat at fancy restaurants that my family pays for, and not satisfied with that, you steal from your aunt. Ethel told my husband about you. I can only say you deserve each other. Here. She shoved the torn pieces of the bill into his hand. You tell that parasite to tape this together and have her final fancy dinner on my husband. Tell her she's not getting another nickel from us, and if she tries, she'll regret it for the rest of her life. She was gone. His lips ashen, Doug collapsed onto the couch. Who else had Ethel, with her big mouth, told about his habit of helping himself to her alimony loot? When Ruth stepped onto the sidewalk, she was hailed by a woman standing on the steps that led to the lobby of the brownstone. I'm sorry to bother you. I'm Ethel's neighbor, and I'm worried about her. You're a friend of hers? Yes, of course. I'm surprised Ethel isn't in, but is there any reason to worry? There's something funny going on. Last week, Ethel had a visit from her ex. Usually, he only comes on the fifth of the month if he hasn't mailed the alimony. So when I saw him sneaking around last week, Thursday afternoon, I thought something was funny. Well, let me tell you, they had a battle royal. I could hear them shouting at each other like I was in the room. He came back on Wednesday, the day before yesterday, and he acted real scared about something. Then I saw him yesterday. Will you tell me why he came back? But nobody's seen Ethel. Now, the way I figure it, he might have done something to her and maybe left a clue that's worrying him. Now, as you're a good friend of Ethel's, help me decide. Should I call the police and tell them I think my neighbor may have been murdered? It was late Friday afternoon when Kitty Conway walked to the perimeter of the Morrison State Park riding stable. She intended to retrace the route from which the horse had bolted 48 hours ago. It took twenty minutes to cover the ground to the steep, rocky incline. In the gathering darkness, Kitty began to make her way down it. The rock slid out from under her sneakers. A sense of anticipation combined with mounting dread made her heart pound furiously. Beads of perspiration were forming on her forehead. There was no sign of a blue sleeve. Halfway down, she came to a large rock and paused to rest on it. She'd get her breath and get home to a hot shower. I was crazy. Thank God I didn't make a perfect fool of myself by calling the police. When her breathing became even, she grasped the side of the rock with her hand to hoist herself up and felt something. Kitty looked down. She tried to scream, but no sound came, only a low, disbelieving moan. Her fingers were touching other fingers, manicured with deep red polish, held upward by the rocks that had slid around them, framed by the blue cuff that had intruded upon her subconscious, a scrap of black plastic like a mourning band embracing the slender, inert wrist. At seven o'clock on Friday morning, Denny Adler, in the guise of a wino, settled against an apartment building directly across from Schwab House. It was still raw and breezy, and he realized the odds were against Neve Carney jogging or walking to work. At about quarter of eight, the exit is started. At twenty of nine, Denny knew this wasn't his day. The one thing he couldn't risk was the deli manager getting mad at him. At ten-thirty, he was delivering coffee to Neve's office. "'Welcome, Denny. I overslept this morning, and now I can't get going until I have a cup of your coffee.' 
We all got to oversleep once in a while, Miss Carney, Denny said as he pulled a container from the bag and solicitously opened it for her. When he came out from shaving, Seamus realized that Ruth had left the apartment. He lumbered into the bedroom and sank down on the bed. Last night, he'd almost hit Ruth. The memory of those last few minutes with Ethel, the exact moment when he'd lost all control, when he'd... He slumped back on the pillow. What was the point of going to the bar, of trying to keep up a front? He'd taken a step he wouldn't have believed possible. He closed his eyes. He wasn't aware that he dozed off, but suddenly Ruth was sitting on the edge of the bed. The anger seemed to have drained from her face. She looked haunted and panic-stricken like someone facing a firing squad. Seamus, you've got to tell me everything. What did you do to her? Gordon Stuber arrived at his office on West 37th Street at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. He had come up in the elevator with three conservatively dressed men whom he instantly recognized as government auditors returning to pore over his books. He walked rapidly to his private office, slamming the door behind him. Thanks to Neve Carney, there was a damn good chance he'd be spending more time in court than in his office. Or prison, he reflected, if he wasn't careful. It was only three years ago that he'd started doing what the rest of them did, set up off-the-books places for immigrants without green cards. And then he'd found where the real money lay. He'd been all set to close out the sweatshops, when Neve Carney blew the whistle on him. Then that crazy Ethel Lamston had started snooping around. He could still see that bitch bursting in here last week, last Wednesday evening. May, his secretary, was still outside. Otherwise, right then, he'd thrown her out, literally taken her shoulders and shoved her across the showroom to the main door, pushed her so she stumbled against the elevator. Even that hadn't fazed her. As he slammed the door, she'd shouted, In case you haven't found out yet, they're going to get you on income tax as well as sweatshops. He'd known then that he couldn't let her keep digging into his affairs. She had to be stopped. At eleven o'clock on Friday morning, Jack Campbell summoned his secretary into his office. Ginny, I was wondering if I could get a copy of the article Ethel Lamston did for Contemporary Woman, the one on fashion... I know Tony Mendel usually won't show anything before the magazine's put to bed, but see what you can do, okay? Sure. An hour later, Ginny came back. The article comes out in next week's issue. Tony said as a favor she'll let you see it. She's also volunteered to send Xeroxes of Ethel's notes since you're her publisher. She told me the outtakes of Ethel's article make pretty hot reading. Neither Seamus nor Ruth went to work on Friday. They sat in the apartment staring at each other like people caught together in quicksand, sinking, unable to reverse the inevitable. Tell me again exactly what happened, Seamus. His round face glistening with perspiration, his hands thick and helpless in his lap, Seamus recounted how he had begged Ethel to let him off the hook, how she toyed with him. I punched her. I never knew I was going to do it. Her head lobbed to one side. She fell backwards. I didn't know if I'd killed her. She got up and she was scared. I told her if she looked for another dime, I would kill her. She knew I meant it. She said, all right, no more alimony. And then you left? Uh, and then I left. There was a sense of something unfinished. Ruth knew Seamus was weak a weak, frightened man who had turned desperate. How desperate? You have not told me everything. I want to know. I have to know. It's the only way I can help you. His head burrowed in her lap. He told her the rest. Oh, my God, Seamus. Oh, my God. At one o'clock, Denny returned to Neve's place with sandwiches and coffee. In her office, Neve was deep in conversation with her assistant. Eugenia, I'll have to wait until late Monday afternoon to go to 7th Avenue. Denny opened the bag and removed the sandwiches. 
Danny, you're spoiling me and Eugenia. This is beginning to feel like room service. Denny froze, realizing his mistake. He was getting too visible, but he had wanted to hear any plans Neve might have. He muttered goodbye and departed, their usual generous tip and thanks ringing in his ears. But two bucks a delivery takes a long time before it adds up to twenty thousand, Denny thought as he stepped into the street. While she was nibbling at the sandwich, Neve dialed Tony Mandel, a contemporary woman. When she heard Neve's request, Mandel exclaimed, "'Ye gods, what is all this about?' Jack Campbell asked for the same thing. "'You can have the article, but for Pete's sake, don't show it around. "'There'll be enough people in the rag game unhappy as it is when they see it.' An hour later, Neve and Eugenia were poring over the copy of Ethel's article. It was entitled, "'The Masters and the Masterful Phonies of Fashion,' and even for Ethel it was bitingly sarcastic." She began by naming the three most important fashions of the past fifty years, the new look by Christian Dior in 1947, the miniskirt by Mary Quant in the early 60s, and the Pacific Reef look by Anthony de la Salva in 1972. About them all, Ethel had written truthful as well as uncomplimentary profiles. (laughs) Uncle Sal will love what Ethel wrote about the Pacific Reef, but I don't know about the rest— He's lied so much, he's convinced himself he was born in Rome and his mother was a papal countess. On the other hand, from what he said the other night, he's expecting something like it. Having covered the giant fashion looks as she saw them, Ethel proceeded in the article to name society designers who couldn't tell a button from a buttonhole and hired talented young people to plan and execute their lines. Then Ethel turned her guns on Gordon Stuber, ending with a direct hit. Folks, every time you don one of his suits, give a thought to the child who sewed it. The article concluded with a peon of praise for Neve Kearney of Neve's Place, who started the investigation of Gordon Stuber and who bans his clothes from her shop. Neve skimmed the rest of the text about her, then put down the papers. What really kills me, Eugenia, is that despite all this, Ethel bought one of his suits last time she was here, the one we slipped up on returning. The intercom rang. Mr. Campbell for you, Miss Carney. Neve, honey, you should see the look on your face. Neve waited until Eugenia closed the door before she picked up the phone. She was embarrassed to realize how her heart was pounding. Jack came right to the point. Neve, can you have dinner with me tonight? I was planning to tell you that I have some of Ethel Lamston's notes and maybe we could go over them together. But the real fact is I want to see you. Can we meet at the Carlisle at seven? It was 6.30 when, as he was turning the key in the lock, Doug Brown heard the persistent ringing of the phone. Ignoring it, as he had all week, he began his dinner preparations. But when it relentlessly continued to peel, he debated. It was one thing that Ethel didn't like anyone to answer her phone— But after a week, wouldn't it seem logical that she might be trying to reach him? Finally, he picked up the receiver. The police were calling him. On Friday, there was a letter from Washington urging Miles to accept the post as head of the Drug Enforcement Agency. Miles felt the old adrenaline flowing through his veins. Sixty-eight. It wasn't that old. And to get his teeth into a job that needed doing... He leaned back in the leather chair that had been in his office the 16 years he'd been police commissioner. It fits my butt, he thought. If I go to Washington, I'll ship it down. On impulse, he phoned his old number to talk to Herb Schwartz. Miles, what are you up to? My question first, Herb. How is Tony Vitale? We're still not sure. I'm going to the hospital later. Want to come? They agreed to meet after lunch. Undercover detective Tony Vitale was swathed in bandages, still unconscious. Intravenous fluid dripped into his veins. There was a round-the-clock guard on him. Herb Schwartz beckoned to the young detective who was sitting in the nurse's station. Listen carefully, son. Anything he might say. Miles and Herb went down in the elevator together. What do you think, Miles? 
There's plenty Tony could have learned that night. They must have been going over everything to make Nicky feel up to date. Oh, Herb, by the way, Neve's been pestering me because some writer she knows has dropped out of sight. Tell the guys to keep an eye out for her, will you? About sixty, five foot five and a half or so. Dyed silver blonde. Weighs about 135. Name is Ethel Lamston. She's probably making someone's life miserable interviewing them for her column. Miles, I've met Lamston at Gracie Mansion. Something of an airhead, isn't she? You've got it. Why is Neve worried about her? Because she swears Lamston left home last Thursday or Friday without a winter coat. Neve and Jack Campbell sat on a banquette in the restaurant. On impulse, she had changed from the sweater dress she'd worn to work to a soft, multicolored print. Neve, aren't you wearing one of the dresses the mannequins show in your display windows? You're very observant. When did you see the shop? Last night. And I didn't just happen by. I was overwhelmingly curious. Jack Campbell did not seem uncomfortable disclosing that fact. Neve studied him. Tonight he was wearing a dark blue suit with a faint chalk stripe. Unconsciously, she nodded approval at the overall effect, the Hermes tie that picked up the blue, the custom-made shirt, the plain gold cufflinks. Will I pass? <laughs> Very few men manage to wear a tie that really goes with their suit. The waiter arrived with their drinks. Jack waited until he left before he spoke. I wish you'd fill me in a little, starting with, where did you get the name Neve? It's Celtic, a goddess. Some say the exact translation is Star of the Morning. My favorite legend about her is that she swooped down to Earth to pick up the fellow she wanted. They were happy for a long time. Then he wanted to visit Earth again. It was understood that if his feet touched the ground, he would become his real age. You can guess the rest. He slipped from the horse, and poor Neve left him a bag of bones and returned to the skies. Is that what you do to your admirers? They laughed together. Over celery remoulade, Jack talked about growing up. Neve felt remarkably, absurdly happy. Over rack of lamb, she told Jack about herself. They waited until they finished their raspberries and were sipping espresso before they discussed Ethel. Jack pulled the folded copy of the article from his pocket. Neve told him she'd already seen it. Would you call this scandalous, Neve? No, I'd call it funny and bitchy and sarcastic and readable. There isn't a thing in it that everyone in the business doesn't already know. Okay, then. Do you think anything in this article would make an explosive book? No, even Ethel couldn't pull that off. Across the street from the Carlisle, Denny was waiting. It was a long shot. He knew that. He'd followed Neve when she walked uptown, but there'd been no chance to get her. His only hope was that she might come out alone, maybe walk to the Crosstown bus or even walk home. But when she left, she was with some guy. Denny swore silently under his breath. He felt for the pistol in his pocket. Last night, Big Charlie had arranged a meeting and handed him a brown paper bag. Denny felt the outline of the gun. Carney is starting to cause real trouble, Denny. It don't matter no more if it looks like an accident. Get her any way you can. That left Monday. And the garment district. Somehow Denny felt in his bones that was where he'd end up. It was ten o'clock when the taxi pulled up to Schwab House. My father will be having a nightcap. Are you interested, Jack? Ten minutes later, they were in the study, sipping brandy. Jack was telling Miles about meeting Neve. I must say I was delighted when she came up to me at the cocktail party and asked about Ethel Lamston. I gather Ethel isn't one of your favorite people, Mr. Carney. Jack, someday I'll learn to listen to Neve's intuition. Miles turned to Neve. Herb Schwartz phoned a couple of hours ago. A body was found in Morrison State Park. It answered Ethel's description. Her nephew has made a positive identification. Miles, what happened? Her throat was cut. They already have a suspect. It seems Ethel had a colossal fight with her ex-husband last Thursday afternoon. 
Apparently, no one has seen her since then. On Friday, she broke her appointments with you and her nephew. Miles swallowed the last of the brandy and got up to refill his glass. Tomorrow morning, our homicide guys want to talk to you. And the DA's office in Rockland County has asked if you'd go out and look at the clothing Ethel was wearing. The point is they know the body was moved after death. The labels were ripped out of the suit she was wearing. They want to see if you can identify it as one of yours. God damn it, Neve! I don't like the idea of you being a witness in a murder case. Jack Campbell reached out his glass for a refill. Neither do I. When she turned on the radio at seven o'clock on Saturday morning, Ruth heard the news of Ethel's death, Ethel's murder. Seamus was just waking up. You killed her. How can I help you if you won't tell me the truth? What are you talking about? The newscaster was describing how and where Ethel had been found. You used to take the girls hiking in Morrison State Park. You know the place like the back of your hand. Now tell me the truth. Did you stab her? An hour later, paralyzed with fright, Seamus made his way to the bar. At two o'clock, shortly after the reasonably busy lunch service was winding down, two men entered. They identified themselves as Detectives O'Brien and Gomez. Would you mind stepping down to headquarters? Detective O'Brien asked. <clears throat> We'd like to go over a few things with you. As Ruth stepped out of a taxi in front of Ethel's apartment, a curtain moved on the fourth floor. The upstairs neighbor who missed nothing. After Ruth's phone call, Douglas Brown had been watching for her and opened the door. What do you want now? I won't waste your time or mine by saying I'm sorry Ethel is dead. I want the letter Seamus wrote her, and I want you to put this in its place. She extended her hand. The envelope was unsealed. Douglas opened it. It contained the alimony check dated April 5th. What are you trying to pull? I'm not pulling anything. I'm making an even exchange. Give me back the letter Seamus wrote Ethel and get something straight. The reason Seamus came here on Wednesday was to deliver the alimony. Ethel wasn't home and he came back on Thursday because he was worried that he hadn't been able to force the envelope into her mailbox. He knew she'd haul him into court if it wasn't there. Why would I do that? Because last week Ethel told Seamus you were stealing from her and she was planning to change her will. Ruth watched as Douglas turned chalky white. You're lying. Am I? I'm giving you a break. You give Seamus a break. We'll keep our mouths shut about you being a thief and you keep yours shut about the letter. All right. I'll get the letter. He went into the bedroom. Ruth moved noiselessly to the desk. Beside the pile of mail, she could see the edge of the red and gold handled dagger Seamus had described to her. In an instant, it was in her purse. Was it only her imagination that it felt sticky? Sticky from Ethel's blood? After Neve left for her shop, Miles had a second cup of coffee and contemplated the fact that Jack Campbell was going to drive with them to Rockland County. Instinctively, he liked Jack very much, and Riley acknowledged that for years he'd been urging Neve not to get hung up on the myth of love at first sight. My God, he thought, is it possible that lightning does strike twice after all? At a quarter of ten, he settled himself in his deep leather armchair and phoned Herb Schwartz for an update on the murder investigation. Miles, we're still concentrating on the ex-husband. We'll see what the search of her apartment turns up. That argument the neighbor heard the week before this past Thursday might have ended in a stabbing. On the other hand, he may have scared her enough to make her decide to get out of town and then followed her. Miles, you taught me that every murderer leaves a calling card. We'll find this one. After learning that Ethel Lamston's body had been found, Gordon Stuber went into a frenzy of activity. He ordered his last illegal warehouse vacated and warned the workers of the consequences of talking to the police. He then phoned Korea to cancel the expected shipment. On learning that it had already left for the airport, he savagely threw the phone at the wall. 
Then, forcing himself to think rationally, he tried to assess the damage. How much proof did Lamston have and how much had been bluff? As he called May, his longtime secretary, into his office, he knew he could count on her discretion. May, was Ethel Lamston in here one evening about ten days ago? There was a night I thought I saw Ethel come in and you make her leave. Am I wrong? Gordon smiled. Ethel didn't come in, May, and I never took any of her phone calls. I understand, sir. Since his divorce from his last wife, Anthony Della Salva had decided to stick to Manhattan. No more boring homes in the suburbs. As he wandered through his massive Central Park West penthouse, Anthony Della Salva thought about the day two months ago when Ethel Lamston had come to his office. That nervous, flapping mouth, her habit of speaking so quickly. Listening to her was like trying to follow the numbers on a ticker tape. She had pointed to the Pacific Reef mural on the wall and pronounced, That is genius. Even a nosy journalist like you recognizes truth, Ethel, he had growled, and they both laughed. Now Sal watched Nicky Cepetti's funeral on television. He was about to turn off the set when Cepetti's widow grabbed a newsman's microphone and pleaded to the world that Nicky had nothing to do with Renata Carney's murder. Sal was sure Miles had been watching. He knew how Miles must be feeling and decided to phone him. He was relieved to hear Miles sound fairly matter-of-fact. It was probably Nicky's deathbed confession to save his soul. Listen, Sal, gotta go. Neve has the unpleasant job of seeing if the clothing Ethel was wearing came from her shop. For her sake, I hope not, Miles. She doesn't need that kind of publicity. Tell Neve if she's not careful. People will start saying they wouldn't be caught dead in her clothes. At three o'clock, Jack Campbell was at the door of the Carney apartment in Schwab House. After work, Neve had changed from her Adele Simpson navy suit into a red and black hip-length ribbed sweater and slacks. The harlequin effect was accentuated by the onyx and garnet earrings she had designed for the outfit. Her nibs the checkerboard, Miles said as she shook hands with Jack. Neve shrugged. I don't relish what I've got to do, Miles. But I have a feeling that Ethel would be pleased if I arrived in a new outfit to talk about the clothes she was wearing when she died. You just can't understand how much pleasure she got from fashion. Jack sensed this fashion debate was a running issue between them and had no intention of being caught in the middle. He walked over to the window where a book that had obviously been damaged was exposed to the waning sunlight. Miles, you simply don't understand that helping women select becoming clothing can make a big difference for them in their social and business lives. I've been written up in Vogue, Town and Country, the New York Times, and God knows where else, but that doesn't cut any ice with you. It's as though I'm stealing from people when I charge them for expensive clothes. Miles turned to Jack. Forgive the domestic upheaval. My daughter is either blessed or cursed with a combination of a Roman temperament and Irish thin skin. For my part, I have never found it possible to understand how women can make such a fuss over clothes. Neve and I, like her mother before her, have interesting discussions on the subject. I gathered that. Jack accepted the glass of burgundy that Miles was offering him. In the old days, Jack, I didn't know one wine from the other. My wife taught me about it. Renata taught me about many things I'd missed along the way. He pointed to the book on the windowsill. That was hers. It got drenched the other night. Is there any way of restoring it? Jack picked up the book. What a shame. These sketches must have been charming. I'll check with a couple of people on my staff and see if I can come up with the name of a good restorer. I'd be grateful, Jack, for anything you can do. The Rockland County District Attorney, Myra Bradley, was an attractive young woman who could not have been more than 36 or 7. The two detectives, O'Brien and Gomez, from the Homicide Squad, were also present. Introductions were made. Myra Bradley waved them to seats and got to the point. According to the medical examiner, death was caused by a violent slash with a sharp instrument which cut her jugular vein and sliced her windpipe. She may have put up a struggle. Her jaw was black and blue and there was a cut on her chin. 
She wasn't meant to be identified. She was wearing no jewelry. There was no handbag or wallet near her. Bradley turned to Neve. If you don't mind, Miss Carney, would you look over the clothing now? They went into an adjoining room. Detective Gomez brought in plastic bags filled with rumpled and stained clothing. Neve watched as the bags were emptied. One of them contained lingerie, a matching bra and panties, the bra spattered with blood, pantyhose with a wide run up the front of the leg. Medium heel pumps of soft blue leather were held together by a rubber band. The second bag held a three-piece suit, winter white wool jacket with blue cuffs and collar, a white wool skirt, and a striped blue and white blouse. All were soaked in blood and smeared with dirt. Resolutely, Neve studied the garments. Something was wrong, something that went beyond the gruesome end to which these garments and the woman who wore them had come. Miss Carney, is this one of the outfits that was missing from Ethel Lamston's closet? Yes. Did you sell her this outfit? Yes, around the Christmas holidays. It's a Gordon Stuber original. Neve turned to Miles. She wore it to our party, remember? Miles shrugged. Neve recalled that Ethel had looked particularly attractive that evening. But there was something different about the memory. What was eluding her? Miss Bradley, was Ethel wearing a coat? No. The district attorney nodded to the detectives to repack the clothing bags. Commissioner Schwartz told me that the reason you began worrying about Ethel was that all her coats were in her closet. But couldn't she have bought a coat from someone other than you? Neve was not about to make a fool of herself by insisting that Ethel simply wouldn't shop anywhere else. I'll be glad to do an inventory of Ethel's closet. I will be able to tell you exactly what's missing. I'd like as full a description as possible, thank you. Jack took Neve's arm as they left the room. Are you okay, Neve? There's something I'm missing. One of the detectives had heard her. He gave her his card. Call any time. I'm Detective Gomez. He was refolding the clothes that had been Ethel's shroud, clothing that Neve knew would someday be seen again at a trial. Last seen wearing. That was it. There was something about the outfit. Neve felt a tremor go through her body. She knew what she had to say and prayed that she wouldn't sound ridiculous. I wonder if I could speak to the woman who found Ethel's body. I don't know why, but I just feel as though I should. She swallowed the lump in her throat. Mrs. Conway has given this office a complete statement. You can look at that if you like. I'd prefer to talk with her. Miss Bradley, my daughter is the reason Ethel Lamston has been identified. If she'd like to speak with this witness, I think she should. Kitty Conway had a fire blazing in the library. It's just that from the moment I touched that poor woman's hand, I haven't stopped feeling cold. She paused, embarrassed, but the three sets of eyes that were observing her all seemed to signal understanding. She liked their looks. Neve Carney better than beautiful. And Kitty's son was the same type as Jack Campbell. Miles Carney, a very good-looking Irishman. Kitty was fleetingly grateful that she'd changed from her jeans and ancient oversized sweater to a silk blouse and slacks. When they refused drinks, Kitty insisted on making tea and disappeared down the corridor to the kitchen. Miles began to examine the framed family photos. The usual history of a life. Myra Bradley had told him that the woman who discovered Ethel's body was a widow. Studying the pictures, Miles reflected that Kitty Conway certainly hadn't lost her looks along the way. As they sipped the tea, Kitty told them about the horse bolting, the plastic flying in her face, and her blurred impression of a hand in a blue sleeve. Throughout, Neve listened attentively. She still had the overwhelming feeling that she was missing something. And then she realized what it was. Mrs. Conway, will you describe exactly what you saw when you found the body? Kitty closed her eyes. It was like looking at a mannequin's hand. It was so white and the nails seemed a garish purple. 
The cuff of the jacket was blue. It came to the wrist, and that little piece of black plastic was sticking to it. The blouse was blue and white, but it hardly showed beneath the cuff. It was sort of crumpled. It was crazy, but I almost straightened it. <sighs> That's what I couldn't get. That blouse. What about the blouse, Neve? Neve bit her lip. Miles was going to think her a fool again. The blouse Ethel had been wearing was part of the original three piece ensemble. But when Ethel bought the suit, I told her I didn't think the blouse was right for it. I sold Ethel another blouse, all white without the distraction of the blue stripes. I've seen Ethel wear that outfit twice, and both times she'd had the white blouse on. I'm sorry, Neve, I just don't get it. I think I do. Kitty Conway looked directly at Miles. If I'm correct, Neve is saying that Ethel Lamston would not have deliberately dressed in that outfit. Neve looked directly into Miles' disbelieving eyes. Is there any way they can establish whether or not someone dressed her after she died? A team of four homicide detectives converged on Ethel's apartment. Douglas Brown watched as they spread powder over surfaces, vacuumed rugs, and minutely examined the small oriental rug. Detective O'Brien went through Ethel's desk. Douglas watched as he read the will and looked over at him. You ever seen this, Mr. Brown? No, those are my aunt's papers. She never discussed her will with you? Douglas managed a rueful smile. She used to kid me a lot. She said that if she could only leave me her alimony payments, I'd be set for life. Then you didn't know that she seems to have left you a sizable amount of money? As Douglas stared in dismay, Detective O'Brien called to the fingerprint expert. Let's dust this. Five minutes later, his hands twisting nervously in his lap, Douglas confirmed and then denied any knowledge of the hundred-dollar bills the homicide squad had found secreted in the apartment. Abruptly, O'Brien cut off the questioning. We'll be coming in tomorrow with Miss Neve Carney. As she'll be checking Miss Lamson's closet for missing items of clothing. We may want to talk to you again. Be here. At St. Vincent's Hospital, Tony Vitale was still in the intensive care unit, his condition critical. A respirator clamped over his face. He drifted from a state of deep coma to fragments of consciousness. On Saturday, as his mind groped toward the surface, he heard the doctor say, Every day he shows a little improvement. Every day? How long had he been here? He tried to speak, but no sound came. When Neve, Miles, and Jack got back to the apartment, there was a call from Police Commissioner Herb Schwartz. Their conversation was brief. When Miles hung up, he said, It looks as though it's all over. The minute they brought in the ex-husband and started questioning him, he cried like a baby and demanded a lawyer. It's only a matter of time till they have enough to indict him. What you're saying is that he didn't confess. As Neve spoke, she could not shake off the feeling of something ominous surrounding her. The feeling that someone was walking on her grave. Jack Campbell was watching her. He knows, she thought. Neve tried to smile. Look, it's been a rotten afternoon. I think we should have a drink. 
Miles scrutinized her face. I think we should have a stiff drink, and then Jack and I should take you out for dinner. He looked up at Jack. Of course, you may have other plans. No plans, except if I may to fix us that drink. The scotch, like the tea at Kitty Conway's, did the job of temporarily taking from Neve the sense of being swept along by a dark current. Miles repeated what the commissioner had told him. The homicide detectives felt that Seamus Lamston was on the verge of admitting guilt. Do they still want me to go through Ethel's closet tomorrow? Yes, they don't want to leave any loose ends. Look, I know this sounds pushy, Miles, but would either of you object if I went along to Ethel's apartment? Miles raised his eyebrows. Not if you promise to fade into the background and keep your mouth shut, Jack. Miles, your dad's absolutely right, Neve. I accept the conditions. Jack was observing Neve and felt another stab of worry. She was still very pale, and her eyes had a sadness that went beyond Ethel Lamston's death. Impatiently, he shook his head. Why am I worried about you, Neve? Jack wondered. The answer came into his thought as simply as though he'd asked the question aloud. Because I love her. On Sunday morning, Detective O'Brien phoned to arrange an interview with Tsitsi for later that day in the Carney apartment. By 2.30, the detective had completed his questioning and snapped his notebook closed. Both you and Miss Carney have been very helpful. Tsitsi, would you mind going to the Lampston apartment? As her housekeeper, you know the place well. I'd like to have your impressions of anything that might be missing. Come over with Miss Carney in about an hour, if you will. I'd like to have another little chat with Douglas Brown first. Miles had been sitting deep in his leather chair, listening to Tsitsi tell about Ethel's angry phone call to her nephew and the money Doug had replaced. So now a greedy nephew enters the picture. Neve smiled wryly. What do you think his calling card would be, Miles? At 3.30, Miles, Neve, Jack Campbell, and Tsitsi entered Ethel's apartment. Douglas Brown was sitting on the couch, his hands twisting in his lap. Detectives O'Brien and Gomez were sitting across from him, their notebooks open. Tsitsi looked at Detective O'Brien. What do you want me to do? I'd like you to take a long look around and see if you notice anything missing, and I'd like Miss Carney to itemize the clothing that is missing from the wardrobe. Miles murmured to Jack. Why don't you go in with Neve? Maybe you can take notes for her. Neve gave Jack the file with the copies of Ethel's receipts. We'll start with the latest purchases first. She pulled out the brand new clothing Ethel had never worn, then worked backwards, reeling off to Jack the items that were still in the closet. It soon became obvious that the missing garments were all suitable for cold weather. So that eliminates the idea that she might have been planning to go to the Caribbean or whatever and deliberately didn't bring a coat. Wait a minute. Abruptly, she stopped speaking and reached far back into the closet to pull out a white silk blouse that had been jammed between two sweaters. That's what I was looking for. Why didn't Ethel put it on? And if she did decide to wear the blouse that came with the outfit, why didn't she pack this one as well? They returned to the living room as Tsitsi was going through Ethel's desk. Detective O'Brien, it's not here. What's not there? Ethel had an antique dagger she used as a letter opener, one of those Indian jobs with a fancy red and gold handle. It was here both days this week when I cleaned. O'Brien looked at Douglas Brown. The opener wasn't here when we dusted yesterday. Any idea where we can find it? Douglas swallowed hard. The letter opener had been on the desk on Friday morning. No one had come in except... Douglas decided it was time to get the heat off himself. Friday afternoon, Ruth Lamston came over. She took back a letter Seamus had left for Ethel. She threatened to tell you people that Ethel was sore at me if I said one word about Seamus. That letter opener was here when she came. You better ask her why she stole it. It was Ruth who sent the lawyer, Robert Lane, to the police station when she received the frantic call from Seamus. When Lane brought him home, Ruth was sure Seamus was on the verge of a breakdown. His eyes red-rimmed, swelling with tears, he shuffled into the bedroom, a crushed and broken man. 
From what your husband told me, Lane explained to Ruth, he might stand a chance of acquittal or reduce charges on a temporary insanity defense. He admitted killing her, Mr. Lane? No. He told me he punched her, that she reached for the letter opener, that he grabbed it from her, and in the scuffle that her right cheek was cut. Yes, I just learned that myself last night. Your husband won't stand up under intense questioning. My advice is that he come clean and try to plea bargain. You believe he killed her, don't you? Yes, Mr. Lane, I do. Over breakfast the next morning, Seamus stared into his coffee cup intently. You'd think it held the secrets of the universe, Ruth thought. Then he straightened up and stared into her eyes. I did not kill Ethel. I frightened her. Hell, I frightened myself. I never knew I was going to punch her, but maybe that came instinctively. She got cut because she went for the letter opener. I got it from her and threw it back on the desk. He waited for her reaction. Ruth, you believe me, don't you? Seamus, swear on your life that you did not kill Ethel. I swear on my life. On the life of my children. Ruth had a fleeting realization. It simply wasn't possible, she decided. I didn't believe you yesterday or Friday. But I believe you now. You're a lot of things and you're not a lot of things, but I do know you could never cut someone's throat. Oh, Ruth, you've got yourself some prize in me. I could have done worse, Seamus. At dinner that night, it seemed to Neve that Jack deliberately, no, thoughtfully, steered the conversation away from Ethel. Instead, he asked Miles about some of his famous cases, a subject Miles never tired of discussing. His casual discourse was interrupted by the telephone. It was Kitty Conway. Neve, I'm sorry to bother you, but I just realized that your father left his hat here. I'm coming into the city tomorrow, so maybe I could drop it somewhere. Oh, wait a minute, I'll get Miles. As she turned the phone over to him, she murmured, You never forget anything. What's up? I was wondering if she'd ever find the damned hat. When he hung up, he looked sheepishly at Neve. She's going to stop by around six o'clock tomorrow. Then I'll take her out for dinner. Want to come? Well, certainly not, unless you think you need a chaperone. Anyhow, I have to get to 7th Avenue. At the door, Jack asked Neve, How about dinner tomorrow night? Dinner's fine, Jack, if you don't mind waiting until I'm finished. I usually make my last stop at Uncle Sal's, so I'll phone you from there. I don't mind. Neve, just one thing. Be careful. You're an important witness in Ethel Lamston's death, and murderers don't hesitate to kill again if someone gets in the way. Is it possible, Neve thought, that so much has happened in a week? It felt as though Jack had always been in her life. What was happening to her? Suddenly an aching chill came over her. What is it, Neve wondered? Death. Monday was Denny's day off from the delicatessen. He planned to follow Neve Carney from her shop to 7th Avenue. He had a new gray sweatsuit, a punk rock wig, and a big manila envelope. In that outfit, he'd look like one of the messengers running all over town. Big Charlie had phoned him yesterday. Get rid of her now, or we'll find someone who can. At ten o'clock on Monday morning, a Korean cargo plane landed at Kennedy Airport. Trucks from Gordon Stuber Textiles were waiting to pick up the crates of dresses and sportswear to be transported to warehouses that did not appear anywhere in the company records. Others were waiting for that same shipment. Law enforcement officers about to make one of the biggest drug busts of the past ten years. A hundred million dollars worth of uncut heroin. A hell of an idea, one observed to the other. I've seen the stuff stashed in furniture, cupie dolls, dog collars, in babies' diapers, but never in the linings of designer clothes. Tell them to be ready to pick up Stuber. Summoned to police headquarters on Monday morning, Douglas Brown was startled when he received the Miranda warning from Detective Gomez. Remember, Doug, you don't need to answer any questions. If you want, you can call a lawyer. Doug thought of Ethel's money and assumed a solicitous stance. I'm perfectly agreeable to answering any questions. 
That first one from Detective O'Brien threw him for a loop. Last Thursday, you went to the bank and withdrew four $100 bills. No point in denying that, Doug. We checked it. That was the money we found in the apartment, wasn't it, Doug? Now, why would you put it there when you told us your aunt always found the money she accused you of taking? Neve chose a pale pink and gray Chanel suit with gold buttons, gray leather pumps, and a matching shoulder bag to wear to work. She pulled her hair into a smooth chignon. Miles nodded his approval. I like that kind of outfit. Better than Saturday's checkerboard. I must say, you have your mother's fine taste in clothes. Approbation from Sir Hubert is praise indeed. At the door, Neve hesitated. Miles, hear me out without hushing me up just this once. The last person who admits to seeing Ethel alive was her ex-husband, Seamus. We know that was Thursday afternoon. Can someone ask him what she was wearing? My bet is that it was a caftan that she just about lived in when she was home. It wasn't in her closet. Miles, don't look at me like that. I know what I'm talking about. The point is, suppose Seamus, or someone else, killed Ethel while she was wearing that caftan and then changed her clothes. Meaning what, Neve? Meaning that if Ethel's clothes were changed after she died, there is no way that ex-husband is responsible for her death. You saw the photographs showing the way he dressed. He has no more idea of fashion than I have of the inner workings of the space shuttle. On the other hand, there is a slimy bastard named Gordon Stuber who would instinctively have chosen something that came from his own company and dressed Ethel the way the outfit was sold. Just before she closed the apartment door behind her, Neve added, You're always talking about a killer leaving his calling card, Commissioner. Robert Lane had cancelled his eleven o'clock appointment and agreed to meet with Seamus and Ruth again. As he observed their strained, weary faces, Lane felt that much more probing of Seamus Lamson would be a mistake. He also realized that Ruth was becoming frightened at her husband's revelations. Mr. Lane, is it possible for someone to charge Seamus with assault or whatever it is for punching Ethel? Technically, Mrs. Lamston, the police could file. The only way I can assist you is if you tell me the truth. There is something that you are weighing and measuring, and I think I need to know what it is. Mr. Lane, I believe I threw away the murder weapon. It was about 3.30 when Anthony Della Salva heard the news about the arrest of Gordon Stuber. He immediately phoned Miles. Listen, Miles, we've all known that Stuber has mob connections. It's one thing for Neve to blow the whistle on him because of workers without green cards. It's a hell of another proposition when she's the indirect cause of a multi-million dollar drug bust. Sal's worried tone flamed the abiding sense of disaster that had haunted Miles all day. The point is, Miles, take care of her. I know she's your kid, but I claim a vested interest. I know, Sal. I just tried calling her. She's already left for 7th Avenue. As soon as she gets to your place, have her phone me. Will do. Before I hang up, Sal, how's the hand? Not bad. Teaches me not to be so clumsy. Much more important... I feel crummy about ruining the book. Quit worrying. It's drying out, and Neve's new beau, a book publisher, is going to bring it to a restorer. No way, Miles. That's my responsibility. I'll send someone up for it. <laughs> Sal, you may be a good designer, but I think Jack Campbell is perfect for this job. Miles, I insist. So long, Sal. Monday was usually a slow day in retailing, but from the moment she unlocked the door that morning, the place was busy. As Neve was about to stop for a late lunch, a call came from Detective Gomez. Miss Carney, I gather you have a pretty strong hunch that Ethel Lamston may have been dressed after she died. Yes. Neve felt the color drain from her cheeks. Our tests aren't complete, so it's pretty hard to be sure if you're right. But we do know the body had been moved. Tell me this. Would Ethel Lamston have left her home with a wide run in her hosiery? Neve remembered noticing that run when she identified Ethel's clothing. Never. It happened at four o'clock Monday afternoon. In the intensive care unit, undercover cop Tony Vitale's lips were moving. He whispered a word. He's saying his own name, the nurse told the detective on duty. 
Bending, the officer put his ear to Tony's lips. He heard Carney, then a faint knee. He touched Vitali's hand. Tony, I'm a cop. You just said Neve Carney. Squeeze my hand if I'm right. He was rewarded by the faintest pressure on his palm. Tony, when you came in here, you talked about a contract. You said, Nicky, no contract. Was there more? Again, a feather-like pressure on his hand. The detective had a sudden, chilling thought. Were you trying to tell us that Zepetti didn't put out a contract on Neve Carney, but someone else did? His hand was gripped convulsively. Tony, I'm watching your lips. If you know who ordered it, tell me. Voiceless, Tony moved his lips slowly, puckering and releasing them to form the syllables. The officer watched intently. I think he's trying to say something like, true. The nurse interrupted. To me, it was stupor. After the interrogation of Doug Brown, Detectives O'Brien and Gomez discussed the known facts of the case. They jointly agreed that Doug Brown was a punk, that his story was thin, that he'd probably been stealing from his aunt. O'Brien leaned back in his chair. That Ethel Lamson was some judge of character. Her ex-husband is a wimp, her nephew is a thief. But of the two scumbags, I say the ex-husband wasted her. Gomez knew it was time to unveil his theory. Why would Seamus Lamston hide her body? It was only a fluke that it was discovered so soon. He'd have had to keep sending alimony to her accountant. Or why would the nephew hide the body and rip off identification? If Ethel had rotted undisturbed, he'd have to wait seven years to get at her dough. If one of them did it, they'd have wanted the body discovered, right? O'Brien raised his hand. Don't credit these punks with brains. We just keep breaking them over, making them nervous, and sooner or later one of them will say... I didn't mean to do it. I still bet on the husband. For five bucks you want the nephew? Gomez was saved from making the choice when the request came from the commissioner to report to his office immediately. Police Commissioner Herbert Schwartz spoke quietly but intently to his two detectives. I've just been told that Gordon Stuber may have ordered a contract put on Neve Carney. She blew the whistle on him that started the investigation that led to the drug bust but Ethel Lamston may also have gotten wind of his activities. So now there's a damn good chance that Stuber may have been involved with Ethel Lamston's death. We'll interrogate him immediately. I want to either pin down or eliminate the ex-husband. An hour later, in two separate interrogation rooms, Gordon Stuber and Seamus Lamston were being questioned. Stuber's lawyer hovered beside him as the questions crackled from Detective O'Brien. Do you have any knowledge of a contract put out on Neve Carney? Gordon Stuber, immaculate despite his hours in the detention pen, burst out laughing. You've got to be kidding, but what a great idea. In the next room, Seamus Lamston, under instructions from his criminal lawyer, told his story. Then there were the persistent questions. You punched Ethel Lamston. Yes, she picked up the letter opener and tried to attack you? Yes. Then you twisted it from her and killed her? No. 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 Herb Schwartz listened, his face impassive, his eyes wary, as for the second time that afternoon he conferred with his detectives. Gomez decided he had to tell the commissioner what he thought. Sir, I spoke with Miss Carney. She is sure that there's something wrong about the outfit Ethel Lamson was wearing. Also, the autopsy shows the victim tore her hosiery when she put it on. When that pantyhose was pulled over her right foot, her toe caught and caused a huge run clear up the front. Miss Carney believes Ethel Lamson would never have walked out looking like that. I respect Miss Carney's opinion. Have you got the autopsy report and morgue shots? Yes, sir. When the envelope was produced, Herb studied the pictures with clinical detachment, the hand protruding from the ground, the body frozen by rigor mortis, the close-ups of Ethel's jaw black and blue, the bloody nick on her cheek. Herb turned to another print. This depicted only the area between Ethel's chin and the bottom of her throat. 
The ugly, jagged opening made Herb grasp the print convulsively. The way the throat had been cut, that long slash down, then the precise line from the base of the throat up to the left ear. He'd seen that exact thrust once before. As usual, the streets were filled with the hyperactivity of the garment district. As Neve headed for the next sports warehouse, a man in a gray sweatsuit, a large envelope under his arm, heavy dark glasses, and a freakish punk rock hairstyle rushed toward her through the stalled traffic. For an instant they had eye contact, and Neve felt as though an alarm had sounded. A truck pulled out blocking the messenger, and Neve suddenly deciding to go see Sal rapidly walked down another street. She had given up trying to convince Miles that the blouse Ethel was wearing in death was important. But Sal would understand. In his office, Jack Campbell tried to concentrate on the mountain of mail that Ginny had left on his desk. But it was impossible. The sense of something being terribly wrong was overpowering. Ginny studied him from the doorway. Trouble, Jack? The mail can wait. No, it's just this Ethel Lamston business. There's something I've been missing, and I've racked my brains trying to figure it out. Let me look over that file Tony Mendel sent. Maybe there's something in Ethel's notes. At 5.30, when Ginny looked in to say goodnight, Jack was still poring over Ethel's voluminous and meticulous research. For every designer mentioned in her article, she had put together a separate file containing biographical information and copies of dozens of clippings from newspapers and magazines. Jack skimmed the material until he saw the name Gordon Stuber. Jack had heard about Stuber's arrest and wondered if Ethel had discovered that Stuber was smuggling heroin. It ties in with Ethel's big scandal, and it ties in with Neve's theory about the clothes Ethel was wearing. Neve. His need to be with her was overpowering. He hadn't even once held her in his arms, and now they ached for her. She said she would phone from her Uncle Sal's place when she was ready to leave. Sal. Anthony Della Salva, the famous designer. The next pile of clippings were about him. The file was thick with illustrations of the Pacific Reef collection. I can see why people went for it, Jack thought, and started to stack the papers. But there was something he had missed, something bothering him. He had read Ethel's final draft of her article. Now he looked at the next-to-last version. It was heavily annotated. Chicago Aquarium check dates. Ethel had clipped one of the fashion sketches of the Pacific Reef collection to the top of her working draft. Next to it, she had drawn a sketch. Jack's mouth went dry. He had seen it in the stained pages of Renata Carney's cookbook. And the aquarium. Of course. With dawning horror, he began to understand. But he had to be sure. At one minute to five, Chicago time, the long-distance number he dialed was answered. The question tumbled from Jack's lips. As he waited, he realized his hands were clammy. The answer from the curator of the aquarium was even more frightening than he had anticipated. Neve, he thought. Neve, be careful. Miles had a persistent sense of foreboding that he could not shake all day. By late afternoon, he realized he wanted to talk to Neve. When he dialed a shop, Eugenia reminded him that she was on 7th Avenue. He had just put the receiver down when the phone rang. It was Sal confirming that he, too, was worried about Neve. For the next half hour, Miles debated about calling Herb Schwartz. But for what? Long ago, he'd discovered that working with his hands had a calming effect on him. He decided that for the next twenty minutes or so, he expected Kitty Conway at about six, he'd see if he could fix the handle that had broken off the espresso pot. Settling himself in the den, Miles studied the coffee pot. He realized that loose or broken screws were not the reason the handle had come off. So what had caused the accident? He tried to remember exactly what happened the night Sal had burned himself. Kitty Conway looked at the hat Miles Carney had forgotten. 
The moment she'd discovered it, she'd known that it was his excuse to see her again, and was pleased. At 4.30 she debated between two outfits, a simply cut square-necked black wool that accentuated her slenderness, and a two-piece blue-green print that played up her red hair. Go for it, she decided, and reached for the print. At five past six, the concierge announced her arrival and gave her Miles' apartment number. When she got off the elevator, Miles was waiting in the hallway. She knew immediately there was something wrong. His greeting was almost perfunctory. Kitty, bear with me. There's something I'm trying to figure out, and it's important. They went into the den. Don't worry about me, Miles. Get on with what you're doing. Miles returned to the coffee pot. The point is that this handle didn't just come loose. It was forced off. It was new, and the first time Neve was using it, so maybe it came that way. But for God's sake, wouldn't she have noticed the damn handle was hanging by a thread? Kitty looked at Miles. He was holding the handle against the pot, his expression intent. She walked over to stand beside him. Her glance fell on the open cookbook. The pages were stained with coffee, but the sketches were accentuated rather than diminished by the discoloration. Kitty bent over and examined them closely, then reached for the magnifying glass next to them. How charming! That's Neve, of course. She must have been the first child to wear the Pacific Reef look. How chic can you get? It was five minutes past six when Neve arrived at Sal's building. The uproar of the fashion district had ended for the day, the lobby guard no longer at his desk. As usual, after six o'clock, only one elevator was in service. The door was closing when she heard footsteps scurrying down the marble floor. Just before the door snapped shut, she caught a glimpse of a gray sweatsuit and a punk rock haircut. Their eyes met. The messenger... Her mouth suddenly dry, she waited until she had reached the twelfth floor, then pushed every button to send the elevator up to the twentieth. The door to Sal's showroom was open. She ran in and closed it behind her. The room was empty. Sal! Uncle Sal! He hurried from his private office. Neve, what's the matter? Sal, someone is following me. Lock the door, please. Are you sure? Sal, I know who it is. He works in the coffee shop. Why would he be following you? I don't know, unless Miles was right all along. Is it possible Nicky Sabetti wanted me dead? They could hear the whirring of the elevator as it made its way back down. Neve, get behind that mannequin. I'll be in back of the door. If someone comes in, I can get a drop on him. The point is to detain him to find out who sent him. Sal opened his desk drawer and pulled out a gun. Neve, get behind that mannequin. As though in a dream, Neve obeyed. She realized that the mannequins were dressed in Sal's new line with accessories blazoned with the brilliant colors of the Pacific Reef collection. She stared at the scarf that was brushing her face. That pattern. Sketches. Mama, are you drawing my picture? Mama, that's not what I'm wearing. Sketches. Renata's sketches drawn three months before she died, a year before Anthony de la Salva stunned the fashion world with a Pacific Reef look. Sketches that only last week Sal had tried to destroy. Neve heard the elevator stop and slide open. The faint sound of footsteps in the hall. She saw the silhouette of a hand, the muzzle of a gun, as Neve watched, Sal stepped noiselessly from behind the door. He raised the gun. Denny? As Denny spun around, Sal fired. The bullet went through Denny's forehead. Stupefied, Neve watched as Sal pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and reached down and picked up Denny's gun. You shot him. You never gave him a chance. He would have killed you. Sal dropped his own gun on the desk. I was only protecting you. He began to walk toward her, Denny's pistol in his hand. You knew his name. You planned this. The warm, jovial mask that had been Sal's permanent expression was gone. His hand, still blistered and red, raised the gun and pointed it at her. Of course I did. 
The word is out that Stuber ordered you hit. What nobody knows is that I'm the one who started that rumor, and I'm the one who gave out the contract. I'll tell Miles that I managed to get your killer, but was too late to save you. Don't worry, Neve. I'll comfort Miles. I'm awfully good at that. Neve stood, rooted, unable to move, beyond fear. My mother designed the Pacific Reef look. You stole it from her, didn't you? And somehow Ethel found out and you killed her. You dressed her, not Stuber. You knew which blouse belonged with the ensemble. <laughs> Neve, when I saw a Pacific Reef sketch in the cookbook, I knew I had to get rid of it any way I could, even if it meant burning my hand. You'd have made the connection sooner or later. Miles wouldn't have recognized it blown up to billboard size. Ethel found out my story about getting inspiration for the Pacific Reef look in the Chicago Aquarium was a lie. I told her I could explain it and went to her place. She was smart, all right. She told me she knew I'd lied and why I'd lied. That I'd stolen that design. And she was going to prove it. Ethel had seen the cookbook. She had copied one of the sketches in her appointment book. Was that how she made the connection? She didn't live long enough to tell me. If we had time, I'd show you the portfolio your mother gave me. The whole collection is there. This wasn't Uncle Sal. This wasn't her father's boyhood friend. This was a stranger who hated her, hated Miles. Neve, you damn fool. I didn't just steal the Pacific Reef look from your mother. I cut her throat for it. Kitty could barely hear Miles' voice. It's Sal. He ripped the handle off the coffee pot. He tried to ruin those sketches. And Neve is with him now. My car is outside, Miles. It has a phone. As he drove screeching down West End Avenue, Miles gave Kitty a number to dial. Silently she obeyed and handed the phone to him. Miles Carney, put the commissioner on. Frantically, Miles steered around the heavy evening traffic. Ignoring red lights, he left in his wake a snarl of angry motorists. Miles, Herb here. I just tried to reach you. We believe Stuber put a contract out on Eve. And, Miles, I think there's a connection between Ethel Lamston's murder and Renata's death. The V-shaped slash in Lamston's throat? It's exactly the same as the wound that killed Renata. Renata? Her throat slashed. Renata, lying so quietly in the park. No sign of struggle. Renata, who had not been mugged, but who had met a man she trusted, her husband's boyhood friend. Oh, Jesus, Miles thought. Oh, Jesus. Herb, Neve is at Sal's. Send your guys there fast. Sal is a murderer. Neve. Neve. Let me be on time. Grant me my child, Miles prayed. Jack laid down the phone, still absorbing what he had just heard. The new museum opened 18 years ago, but the magnificent display on the top floor that had reproduced the dazzling sense of walking the bottom of the ocean at the Pacific Reef had not been completed until 16 years ago. Anthony de la Salva had claimed that his inspiration for the Pacific Reef look had been occasioned by a visit to the Chicago Aquarium 17 years ago. Ethel had picked up the discrepancy and pursued it. Now she was dead. Jack thought of Neve's absolute insistence that there was something odd about the way Ethel was dressed. He thought about Miles saying, Every killer leaves a calling card. Gordon Stuber wasn't the only designer who might have mistakenly clothed his victim in a seemingly appropriate outfit. Anthony de la Salva might have made exactly the same mistake. Jack hailed a cab, threw twenty dollars at the driver, and shouted out the address. It was eighteen minutes past six. Is this the way it was for Mother, Neve thought? Did she look up at him that day and see the change come over his face? Did she have any warning? Neve knew she was going to die. She had felt all week that her time was running out. Now that she was beyond hope, it seemed suddenly vital to have those questions answered. 
Sal had moved closer to her. Behind him, the crumpled body of Denny oozed blood along the floor. From far off, Neve heard a faint whir of an elevator. Someone might be coming. Could she delay the instant when Sal pulled the trigger? Uncle Sal, why was it necessary for you to kill my mother? Couldn't you have worked with her? There isn't a designer who doesn't pick the brains of apprentices. When I see genius, I don't share, Neve. She heard the sliding of an elevator door. Someone was there. To keep Sal from hearing the sound of footsteps, Neve shouted. Shut up! Sal stretched out his hand. The muzzle of the pistol loomed before Neve's face. She turned her head and saw Miles standing in the doorway. Miles, he'll kill you! Sal spun around. Miles didn't move. The absolute authority in his voice rang through the room as he said, Give me the gun, Sal. The police will be here any minute. They know about you. You can't lie your way out of this one. So give me the gun. From down the street, Kitty Conway heard the insistent scream of sirens. Miles had told her not to leave the car. Agonized, she waited. Directly in front of her, a cab stopped and Jack Campbell rushed out. Kitty pushed open the car door and ran after him into the lobby. Della Salva, Jack snapped. I know. They were on the way up before the police burst into the lobby. The elevator lumbered to the twelfth floor. Wait here, Kitty. Jack stood in the doorway. The room was heavily shadowed in the scene like a surrealistic painting. The bloody body on the floor. Neve and her father with a pistol pointed at them. The glint of metal on the desk near the door. Another gun. Could he reach it in time? Then, as he watched... Anthony de la Salva dropped his hand to his side. Miles, I didn't mean it. I never meant it. Sal fell to his knees and put his arms around Miles' legs. Miles, you're my friend. Tell them I didn't mean it. For the last time that day, Police Commissioner Herbert Schwartz conferred in his office with Detectives O'Brien and Gomez. He looked exhausted. De la Salva had admitted to murdering Ethel Lamston. Gomez spoke up. Sir, now that we know that Seamus Lamston is innocent, do you want to press the assault charge against him and the tampering with evidence charge against his wife? Did you find the murder weapon? Yes, on the shelf in that Indian craft shop, just like she told us. Let's give the poor bastards a break. Settling themselves in the den, Miles reached for the bottle of wine. Kitty was sitting in a corner of the couch, her red hair soft and shimmering under the glow of the Victorian table lamp. Miles felt suddenly tongue-tied. How do you thank a woman for saving your daughter's life? If Kitty had not connected the sketch to the Pacific Reef look, he would not have reached Neve on time. Miles thought of how, after the cops took Sal away, Kitty had wrapped her arms around him. I didn't listen to Renata. I never listened and because of that she went to him and died. She went to him for an expert's opinion, Miles. Be honest enough to admit you couldn't have offered her that. How do you tell a woman that because of her presence, the terrible rage and guilt you've carried all these years is in the past? That instead of feeling empty and devastated, you feel strong and eager to look ahead? Neve and Jack stood on the terrace and looked out over the Hudson River. Jack, why did you go to Sal's office? Ethel's notes on Sal were annotated with references to the Pacific Reef look. She had a whole bunch of ads showing it, and next to them she'd done a sketch. I realized I'd seen the same one in your mother's cookbook. And you knew? I remembered you telling me how Sal created that look after your mother died. Ethel's notes showed that Sal claimed he'd gotten the inspiration for the Pacific Reef look at the aquarium in Chicago. That simply wasn't possible. Everything fell into place when I realized that. Then, knowing you were with him, I almost went crazy. Nee felt Jack's arm go around her waist. The movement was not tentative, but sure and steady. Neve? All these years she'd been telling Miles that when love happened, she would know it. She lifted her lips to Jack's waiting mouth.
While My Pretty One Sleeps by Mary Higgins Clark was read by Jessica Walter and adapted for audio by Judith Benenson. Linda Ross was the production coordinator, Jim Anderson the recording engineer. Penny Hain was the editor. Post-production was by Gary Fink. The program was produced and directed by Carol Shapiro.